Ever since you were a child, you dreamt of dragons, breath of fire that singes cities, leather wings that beat with the sound of thunder, golden eyes and crimson scales. You've never seen one. They're exceedingly rare, rumored extinct, and yet you are compelled by the idea of dragons. To you, they seem the very quintessence of liberation. With power and might to spare, and wings that might bear them to distant lands, far from sorrow and obligation. Eyes to the evening sky, each night since childhood, you've strained to see those wings in flight, a stream of flame across the clouds. The village boys and girls always say the dragons died out long ago. It's foolish to keep believing in them. But you can't help it. Something keeps them on the wind of your dreams, even as you come of age. Secretly, you've always held the belief in some unspoken, dimly lit corner of your mind that dragons are somehow part of you. It's hard to explain. Like a symbolic guide or an emblem of your deepest inner nature, you'd never say so aloud. How silly and presumptuous to liken yourself to a beast of such awesome power. But a year ago, everything changed. As you were cleaning the stables, like you do each day, your parents brought you into the cottage to tell you something important, something they wish they could have told you a long time ago. You can still recall the uneasy expressions on their faces as they tried to find the words. Even now, you hardly believe what they told you. For starters, they were not your real parents. Though they'd raised you from infancy, fed and clothed you, and ensured you received an education, you were, in fact, the child of a prominent family. A very prominent family, in fact. You were the sole offspring and heir to the old royal line of this kingdom a child of the king, the former king, beloved by all the subjects of the kingdom until his death many years ago. It was too outrageous to believe at first. You've only ever been a farmer's child, tending to stables, milking the cows, feeding the chickens. The thought that you were, in fact, the exiled scion of a line of great kings and queens was preposterous. But somewhere in that same secret place where live your dreams of dragons, you've always felt you had some greater destiny, some fate beyond the farm, the stables, the chicken coop. You always believed you were meant to do bigger things, to spread your wings, so to speak. Your parents told you this on your last birthday, precisely one year before you would officially come of age. They told you then to prepare you, because the moment you came of age, you would be eligible to take the throne of the kingdom. But to do so, you would need to summon great strength and courage. For a usurper now rules the kingdom as regent, and he would not easily be deposed. You would need to train your body and mind for such a confrontation, if, indeed, you should choose to undertake it. Your parents your adoptive parents who've loved and cared for you all these years, with tears in their eyes, insisted that it was your choice. 
They were sorry for keeping the truth from you for so long. They only wished to protect you. Whatever you choose to do with this new knowledge, they will support you and love you still as their own. There is just one problem. On the same day your parents revealed your true identity, they also shared the greatest obstacle to your ascension. You see, when you were born, the king had made for you a ring. It was no mere piece of pretty jewelry, but a symbol of your house, cast in gold and pressed with the royal seal. This was tradition for all those born to inherit the throne of the kingdom. The ring was physical proof of your right to rule. So where is the ring now? you inquired. With it, you could march into the capital city, stand before the king regent, and demand he step down in favor of the rightful heir. But that's just the thing, your parents say. In the commotion to remove you from the castle on the night of the coup, your ring was lost. The story goes that it was stolen by the fearsome dragon who lives in a cave beneath the western mountains, guarding a hoard of treasure. At this, your heart leapt. Never had you heard your parents or anyone in the village speak of dragons with such currency. It was a foregone conclusion to most that the dragons had all disappeared from the known world. But you could hear the ring of truth in this story. You believed it with all your might, and it incensed your heart, the injustice of it. From that moment, you vowed to spend the next year training to confront the dragon, so that when you came of age, you could recover the lost signet and claim your birthright. Now, as your birthday nears once more, you feel an entirely different person than you were before you learned the truth. You are a different person. You went from believing that as you came of age, you'd work toward inheriting your parents' farm. And that thought was satisfying enough. Now you may stand on the precipice of inheriting the keys to the entire kingdom, and you wonder whether you really have the ambition for it. You've worked hard to prepare both physically and mentally for the challenges ahead, knowing that if the legendary dragons are any guide, they're more than formidable foes for the mind as well as the body. They're always ready for a battle of wits. You've sharpened yours like an axe upon a whetstone, just as you've trained in agility and swordsmanship. On the eve of your birthday, you go to your parents and ask their blessing to leave the farm, to pursue the dragon, recover your lost ring, and begin your quest to reclaim the throne. With tears in their eyes, they grant that blessing, though not before cooking you a scrumptious meal and showering you with love. As dawn breaks over the village in the valley, you rise with the sun and don your modest light armor. You carry a sword of rustic make by the local blacksmith who agreed to work for a reduced fee in a scabbard at your hip. Just knowing it's there makes you feel taller, stronger. But your belly fills with butterflies at the thought of leaving home 
and taking on such a massive obstacle alone. Just as the sky grows rosy and vermilion in the burgeoning sunrise, and the morning mist kisses your cheeks like dew upon the grass, you take the first solitary steps toward your fate. The road to the western mountains where the dragon guards his gold is long. Three days ride on horseback but you've never been much of a rider. And the workhorses from the farm are not meant for traveling long distances and over mountains. So you set off on foot, carrying only the lightest of rations and a pack of simple supplies. The sword is the heaviest thing you bear, and at times you can feel it weighing you down when you'd otherwise move swiftly. But the slow pace, if nothing else, allows you time for contemplation, meditation, and concentration. There's unease, of course. Anyone walking away from home with the intent of facing down a dragon would feel uneasy. But there's also something else Harder to explain. A feeling of calm inevitability and a shining confidence that you are being drawn along a golden string, a quivering cord of destiny. Every step brings you closer to your fate, and there's something exciting about it. The road winds through some tiny villages where you're grateful to stop for the night, take in some hot food, and sleep in a warm bed in a tavern. Remembering your parents' advice about keeping your identity close to your chest, you're careful to hide the sword in your pack whenever you pass through populated areas, and you avoid too many questions about the nature of your travel. But as you draw closer to the mountains, you listen thoughtfully to the tavern gossip, hoping to hear some whisper about the beast's whereabouts or weaknesses, some morsel of discourse about the king regent. You pick up few conversations of consequence. Other nights you camp under the stars, lulled to sleep by the sound of crickets chirping and night owls through the trees. Dragons drift listlessly through your dreams, sometimes made of stars and sometimes fire or water. One night you dream you can see through the eyes of a dragon And as you soar over lakes and snow-capped mountains, you relish the unbridled freedom before you. Your shadow skims the countryside below, so large as to block out the sun and bring night over cities. It's five days' travel, after all, to the foothills of the western mountains. Mist shrouds the peaks and an uncanny silence lends a haunting quality to the atmosphere. Your footsteps on the gravel are the only disturbance in the quiet. The highest summit in the range is that of Mount Arden, which now all but disappears in the descending fog. You're certain that it's here, beneath this skyward mass that your dragon keeps its quarry. Here you must prove your mettle. To reach the base of Mount Arden, you must weave carefully through narrow crevasses and rocky pathways. Binding your footing on the ever-changing incline is a challenge in itself, but each time your heart begins to doubt whether you've chosen the correct route, 
your eyes fall upon a cairn, a pile of stones placed precisely and unmistakably by human hands. Whether they're trail markers left behind by other would-be dragon slayers or tributes to the beast beneath the mountain, you cannot say, but they comfort you nonetheless. At the very least, they are evidence of another soul who passed this way and chose to memorialize that passage. It makes you feel less alone, as though that unknown wanderer walks beside you. All the while your thoughts turn over and over the possibilities that await you, you reflect on the person you were just over a year ago, the modest ambitions you had, the responsibilities that seemed so sacred to you once and now feel small. Though your dreams have grown dragon's wings, reaching for the grand, sweeping adventure before you, you can't help but ache just a little for mornings on the farm a day of hard work, followed by good home-cooked food and a quiet evening. The company of friends, all in the blush of youth and irreverence. It's such a strange tension, such an unexpected twinge of homesickness. For never before have you held your simple life in any high regard. Ah, but the promise of palaces. Once again, your heart soars. You've never dared to dream of such a life. What delights must wait behind closed doors, held only for the elite court? Weren't you born into greatness, only to be spirited away to escape a rebellion? Isn't it the life you deserve? Is it the life you want? You stumble over the rocks and into the shadow of the afternoon. The day is getting away from you. This final leg of the journey is longer and more meandering than you expected. It's as though the lackadaisical pattern of your musings is reflected in the twists and turns of the path. But soon your thoughts are stopped as before you yawns the mouth of a great and gloomy cave. It's just as you imagined, just as it should look in a storybook. A shiver runs over you. But it's not quite fear you're feeling, so much as a frisson of anticipation. Therein lies your fate, should you choose to meet it. You always have a choice. For a moment, you consider turning back, following the cairns out of the foothills, resting for the night in one of those friendly taverns, and returning to your village to live your life as a farmer. Your parents would be happy to see you safe, and you'd be no worse off. Or perhaps you'd keep walking down the road, find a place to live in the capital, build yourself a whole new life, perhaps even reveal yourself when the time feels right, ring or no ring, or forget everything. You've got enough survival skills to live in the woods. Maybe you'll become a hermit or a mad prophet doling out advice and prophecies to travelers who stumble through your forests. But no, you think. If you refuse to answer this call now, then all your life you'd wonder what would have happened if you earned your crown, faced your dragon. There's the shiver again. At the heart of all this, you realize, 
is a burning desire, so long kept under wraps to see a dragon. It's all you've ever wanted. Not thrones or power or wealth. Magic. Proof that there is still some magic in this world. With wings. And it's with that thought that you step across the threshold of the cave, feeling the instant drop in temperature and the air's moisture rise. It's with this little fire in the pit of your belly that you retrieve a torch and tinderbox from your pack, lighting your way down the dark passage of the cave, cutting through your indecision with fire. You move carefully through the darkness, your torch rising and falling with your step throwing its amber light across the walls and floors of the cave. It's as though you reflect the dexterity-challenging path through the foothills to the base of the mountains was trying to prepare you for the tests you'd face here, absent the sun's light. You keep your breathing steady, your feet agile, ready for sudden unevenness in the ground or unseen obstacles. The torchlight flickers with an intimate radius. Beyond it, the unknown. Your mind searches for patterns, resets when the unseen becomes visible. The slow, deliberate nature of the journey lulls your mind into a contented calm. There's an almost imperceptible decline in the floor. You descend, step by step, lower and lower, little by little. Your footsteps on the damp stones echo across the cavernous walls deeper and deeper down. You might have walked a mile or more, or perhaps descended only a few fathoms. As the resonant silence envelops you, it's hard to tell time or distance. But at last, there's another change in the atmosphere. The moisture in the air thins, stretches out. There's an earthy scent listing on the air that wasn't there before. Even without seeing it yet, you can sense that the close walls of the cave are becoming more spacious, opening up into a vast cavern. Now the reservoir of your torchlight falls on something other than slate gray stone. Limestone stalagmites materialize before you like great accumulations of melted wax. Stalactites cling to the ceilings. Water drips in hollow, musical tones, like tiny mallets striking tiny bells. And there's another texture, too, in the cavern. The torch casts its amber light on crimson scales, blackened and armorial, slow, unconscious breath and heaving motion. Your eyes begin to adjust to the darkness in the immense cavern, revealing more and more of the beast, as though your light is growing in size and throw. Oh, and a magnificent beast it is, all covered with those black and crimson scales like terracotta, leathery wings folded by its side. Its eyes are closed, and its nostrils flare as it breathes heavily, sound asleep. Twisted ivory horns extend from its head as if windswept. Your heart swells 
and your breath catches. The sheer size of the thing is enough to make you lightheaded, but you can't help but find it beautiful, rapturously so, curled and coiled, vast as the chamber is, the creature hardly fits within such confines. Why, oh why would this majestic animal choose such tight quarters for a lair when it could have the world, the skies, the sea, all of it? This place is fit for hoarding treasure, but not for living. But, scanning the floor beneath the dragon's mammoth figure, searching with your light for the faintest glimmer of gold, you fail to find any trace of treasure. Curious. And now, tracing your way along its length with a thousand questions rising to your mind, you see something you hadn't noticed before. There, around the beast's neck, and yes, on its forelegs and hind legs too, you see, are thick iron rings connected to thick iron chains. A feeling like pity rushes over you sorrow like water, to see such power and freedom chained up, stifled. Who would, or even could, subdue a dragon so? The weight of the sword at your hip brings you back to yourself. Perhaps now is the best chance you've got to defeat the dragon strike while it sleeps, then find your signet which must be here somewhere, among the dragon's things, perhaps within its very grasp. Then, signet or no, you could march into the capital with proof of a slain dragon, and be lauded as a hero by the subjects of the kingdom. Summoning as much courage as you can muster, You unsheathe the sword and step into an advantageous position. You take a deep breath and prepare to strike. But your mind cannot let go of the question. Who would chain up a dragon within a mountain and why? Despite your body's readiness to go ahead with the task, your thoughts will not allow you to bring down the sword. After a few moments, and a battle between head and heart, you relax your shoulders and allow the sword to fall at your side. At this very moment, perhaps caused by the slashing of the sword through empty air, a ripple of wind, or the subtlest of sounds, An eyelid lifts. The breathing quickens, and soon the chamber is all alive with coiling and uncoiling movement. Your torch seems to brighten to behold it all as the dragon, awake and inquisitive, unfurls to its full height, gaze intent and fixed on you, small and trembling in its wake. You've gone and woken the dragon, and now your fate must be faced. Your first instinct, though it might seem foolish, is to kneel. You drop to a knee and avert your gaze from the creature. Then you speak, as you imagine princes or princesses from your storybooks might. Infusing your voice with a noble purpose, you state your name, your house, and your intention. For you are heir to the throne of the kingdom, here to recover your birthright and that which was stolen from you. When there is no response, neither growl nor fire, you dare to lift your head. 
the dragon, gathered up still like a great mountain itself, is looking down at you with an expression of unmistakable curiosity. You hadn't known dragons were capable of such expressiveness, but there it is. There's something so human about it. You try to hold your ground and not flinch as the beast retracts its great neck, lowering back down onto its forelegs and bringing its face as close to your level as possible. Its head might be the size of this stable house on the farm back home. You feel so minute, so unthreatening, your sword a mere strand of straw against the dragon's might. But nothing can prepare you for what comes next. The dragon opens its mouth to speak. And the voice, though it sounds as if it hasn't been used in a century, is clear and distinctly feminine. What is it you believe I've stolen, she asks. At first, you're too stunned to respond. You can feel her breath warm on your face and limbs. Observing your shock, she withdraws, curling herself up again, though still watching you expectantly. The chains clink and clatter in her wake. I can't very well hand it over if you don't tell me what it is you're looking for. You find your voice again, though now it sounds weak, distant. A ring, you say, clearing your throat. A signet, the symbol of my house and my rightful claim to the throne. Can't say I've seen it, she responds with an air of nonchalance. So I suppose you'll be on your way. But, you stammer, it must be here. It was stolen when the old king was put down. You must have it. I haven't much, she retorts, angling her head in a gesture toward the emptiness of the cavern. The chains drag along the floor as she shifts. There's so little slack. She can't move very far at all, you see. You should press her about the ring, but you can't get your mind off it. Who did this to you? You ask, pointing to the chains. She releases something like a sigh and slouches. I don't know, she says. All I know is that someone sends a goat or a sheep in here every so often so I don't starve. I never see anyone. For all I know, it might be you who did this to me. Have you never? Have you never left this cave? You ask. The sadness in her eyes tells you everything you need to know. You feel immense tenderness and pity toward the creature. Thoughtfully, deliberately, you lay your sword down upon the floor of the cavern. You ask the dragon if she has a name. She does. But it's one she's chosen for herself. So she's not even sure if it is a name or only a sound she remembered from long ago, before she was imprisoned here. Night is her name. You like it. She begins to warm to you, and you to her. You learn of Night's long imprisonment, and the few happy memories she has of freedom When she hatched, she was kept by kindly humans, and from them she learned the art of speech, though she's had no occasion to practice it with anyone listening. 
She spent all this time telling herself stories. They're her only escape from the darkness. I was supposed to have a different life, she says. You feel a pang of sympathy. You too were robbed of the life you were meant to have. Though there's love and fondness in the one you ended up with, that you can't forget. You tell Knight your story, your humble upbringing, and the shocking revelation of your true parentage. She listens patiently, seeming to hang on your every word delighted for any company outside the stalactites. How you could ever have feared her, you don't know. Why anyone would want to imprison her is an even bigger mystery. If you could see yourself now, you think. The child who dreamt of dragons now conversing with one like an old friend. There's a warmth and a kinship kindled between you and night already, a bond that feels to you stronger than any you formed with your peers in the village. It's as if the two of you were bound on this path toward each other, as if it was she and not some figment of fairy tale imagination who visited you in all those dreams, as if you saw through her eyes in your sleepy soaring across the sky. This ring, she asks, what did it look like? All I know is it bore the seal of my family, you say. But I never even knew them. I'm sure they were good people, says Knight. Her voice is disarmingly gentle. How could anyone see dragons? as monstrous, you wonder. In your eyes, they're miraculous. The conversation turns to the future, the possibility of your reign. Night jokes that she could simply give you one of her teeth and let you carry it into court. A stunt like that would make all the barons swear fealty to you in an instant. You'd be known as the dragon slayer in all the history books. You confess, it's not a title you've ever craved. Do you really wish to rule, she asks, cutting to the core of your ever-questioning heart. You've struggled so far to come up with an answer to this. I don't know, you respond. I've only ever been responsible for myself, a few farm animals. I think I know right from wrong, but I've never had to decide it for an entire kingdom. Knight receives this and looks pensive. Really, so wonderfully expressive dragons are. Can't you break out of those, you ask? gesturing to her chains, which still preoccupy your mind. Burn them to ash, or simply break them with your brute strength. Alas, Knight responds, no breath of fire have I, after all this time in the cold and damp, only thick skin, though it grows brittle. Sharp claws, though they are overgrown, and wings, though they've been folded and weakened for many a year. I wish I could break your chains with my sword, you say. I'd set you free in an instant, only so you could see the world. It's a pity to chain up someone with wings. It's a pity to chain up anyone. In night's eyes, you see something almost inscrutable. A kind of disbelief mixed with warm-hearted gratitude. 
You doubt she's ever heard a word of sympathy for her plight. I think you'd make a good ruler, she says. You feel yourself blush. Then night, the mighty if weakened dragon, unfurls herself, chains scraping against the floor of the cave. I kept something from you, she said, but only because I've kept it secret for so long and didn't know if I could trust you. In unfurling, she brings round her strong, spiked tail to the front of the cavern, where it falls right into the spill of your torchlight. There, sparkling at the end of it, hanging loosely on one of the ivory spikes, is a speck of gold. Go on, she says. Take it. You reach out, hardly believing it, and carefully remove the gold ring from the spike. It's heavier than it looks, solid gold and finely cast. It glimmers in the firelight. Set on its bezel is a raised image delicately engraved. You have to squint to make out the minuscule details. A coat of arms. A shield in which stands a dragon, wings spread, a crown upon its head. Is it really? you ask. Night explains that she hatched on the same day the old king's heir was born. She's younger than she looks. The ruling family whose symbol was the regal dragon, intended to raise her as a companion to the air. Their fates were intertwined, and their lives should grow side by side. But it wasn't meant to be, it seems, for the old king was displaced by a rebellion. Night was captured by the invaders and chained up within a mountain and the air was lost, until now she'd thought forever. But it turns out, the king's child was only spirited away until the day they might return and reclaim the throne. Luckily, night held on to the signet, wishing one day that her valiant friend would come looking for it. All those years, you spent believing dragons were only fairy tales. Here a dragon believed the same thing about you. Your heart aches for the lost time. But it soars with gratitude at having reunited with a friend you didn't know you were missing. Your eyes sparkle with tears. You thank the dragon for telling you the truth and for keeping the signet all this time. You ask her what she remembers of your birth parents. All she says is they were kind. She was young then, too. She never knew much of court or kingcraft. But why, then, you wonder, Did the rebellious forces imprison her so? Why do they still send food into the cave? And why not raise her up to serve the king regent? Knight knows the answer to the last question. By the time of the coup, she was already fiercely bonded to you. Nothing can break the bonds of fate, she insists. Not between hatchlings. You smile, thinking of night now as your sister, scales and wings and all. But she supposes the king regent must believe that if you were still alive somewhere, 
someday you'd come looking for your lost ring. And if he kept me alive, she muses aloud, he must have hoped we'd finish each other off in some final confrontation. He always underestimated us both. He didn't know you'd show kindness to a lonely dragon. You try the ring on, finger by finger. It doesn't fit quite perfectly anywhere. But that doesn't matter. What now, you wonder? Amusingly, you imagine moving into the cave with night, hunting food for her, sharing your lives as the companions you were meant to be. You'll go to court, she says, and you'll be great. Her golden eyes are smiling. I've done my part. We've been separated before, you say. I don't think I can do it without you. Then a thought occurs to you. An outlandish, far-fetched thought which blooms madly and swiftly into a fantasy. Night, you say. You say you haven't got any strength or fire left. But have you actually tried? She cocks her head at an angle, and for a moment you're reminded of one of the dogs on the farm. It's rather endearing. But she understands. You're here now. Together, your resolve is so much stronger. There is so much more to fight for. Night gestures with her head for you to climb aboard her back. At first, you step back in surprise, but she insists. Carefully, using her tough scales to maintain your footing, you climb the magnificent dragon and rest at the nape of her neck. You leave your torch behind on the floor of the cave, where it flickers and crackles still. I believe in you you whisper. So quietly you're not sure night can hear you. You're not sure if you even want her to hear you. But it must be said. You feel her muscles tense as she strains to break the shackles about her legs and neck. You hear the iron groan against her power, resisting but yielding ever so slightly. Night catches her breath and tries again, straining harder. It's no use, she says. They're too tough. I can't break them. Just breathe, you want to say. But you find you don't need to say it. For at the moment you think it, you feel a soft, harmonic pull, like the tensing of the atmosphere into a taut string, a golden thread connecting your mind and the dragon's. You feel her breath synchronize with yours, and it's as though you can see through her eyes, feel the strength and fatigue in her muscles. You are one. Deep in your belly, her belly, you can feel a kindling heat. It tumbles and roars like a rush of water through the mouth of a cave, building and intensifying until it can no longer be caged. You feel an eruption, a release, an exhale of fire, billowing and beautiful. You feel cleansed from the inside out, and you feel powerful. 
The stream of flame melts the links in the chains to molten iron. Night tugs once more at her shackles, and they disappear into liquid and ash. Then she's off and running, lumbering unevenly on feet that haven't traveled in a lifetime. You cling to her scales and hold on for dear life as she moves, thirsty for sunlight and fresh air to breathe. You find yourself laughing, even as you clutch at the dragon's hide. When you break out of the cave, the clean air floods your lungs with such a sweetness. For you, only hours underground, as you gasping for the freshness of it. For night, decades underground. You squint against the sun's brightness. She must be nearly blinded by it. But she's laughing, too. It's all too wonderful. She topples the cairns in her giddy clumsiness, scraping her claws against rock and cliff. She climbs swiftly, you aboard her back, to the peak of Mount Arden where the mist is lifted and the skies are effortlessly clear. You can see for miles around. Far off, on the horizon, the stone walls surrounding the capital city and the palace. Shall we go home, my friend? Night inquires but you're not ready for that just yet. There's a whole world your dragon has never seen. There's a whole sky she has yet to explore. Taking flight for the first time since her imprisonment, night cries out with delight to feel the full expanse of her wings. It's such sweet release. You can feel it too, as if she's an extension of you. As if her wings are your wings, her muscles your muscles. And as they unfurl, you grow more spacious, more free. There's a kingdom beyond the western mountains, waiting for you. But it can wait a little while longer. There are oceans to skim, new foods to taste, lives to be lived. You have a choice. You always have a choice. To rule a kingdom, to learn the ways of justice, and strive to make the world a better place, or to live untethered, unfettered, unkempt, and wild, to taste the sweet freedoms of the world unbothered by the machinations of court. There's time to decide. Night soars with sunset at her heels. The wind dances through your hair. You catch a wave. If they do write history books about you, they won't call you the dragon slayer. They'll call you the dragon rider. What a comfort and a wonder it is to enter warm quarters out of pouring rain, to find pleasant and welcoming company on the unknown road. Indeed, it is one of the chief miracles of this life were it put to you, finding anchorage at the very moment it's most needed.
shuffling off your rain-soaked boots and shaking free of your damp cloak, you care nothing for the stale, musty air of the rooms. They're dry enough and warm plenty and a safe retreat from the storm. In truth, you'd hope to travel well into the night and make it at least a few leagues further down the road. But the storm moved in quite suddenly and without warning. As if by providence, just as the rain began to fall, you perceived a light, fuzzy and orange, in the dale. The innkeeper is kind, the sort of friendly fellow who works in the trade for love of people and deep curiosity about difference. You were met on entry with a thousand questions, from whence you came, to whither you travel, and what news you have from the South. Hot supper, the innkeeper said, would be ready soon, and you'd be most welcome to a mug of ale or cider by the fire. All of that sounds infinitely tempting to you now. Swapping out your wet socks and muddy boots for another pair from your traveling bag. Oh, it's such a comfort to put on dry socks. And hanging your cloak on a hook to dry, you turn back for the door and make your way to the tavern on the ground floor where before there were only a few patrons huddled over pints at solitary tables. Now several more have taken up residence on benches and around the blazing hearth. The innkeeper, a rag slung over his shoulder, brings frosty steins to a table of weary-looking folks in gray-green cloaks. You overhear his jovial greetings to the three of them. Not too often we see half-elves this way, he says, beaming. All are welcome here, of course, and my Mary's lamb and leek pies are just out of the oven. How many for you? Most of the patrons are human, like you, though there's a somewhat surly-looking dwarf at a table in the corner. The whole place is lowly lit, with candles dripping wax, the pools in brass and copper holders on every table. Wooden crossbeams on the low ceiling and slab stone archways reflect the candlelight and that from the fireplace, which offers a pleasing crackle. You find yourself an open table, close to the half-elf party and a perfect distance from the fire where its warmth is enough to comfort you, but not so intense as to flush your cheeks and sting your eyes. The innkeeper is glad to see you freshened up and ready for company. His rosy face, plump and pleasant, splits into a welcoming smile. You'll have one of those pies sent to you straightway, unless you prefer stew and fresh bread, of course. He can rustle up anything you like. You hadn't realized how hungry you were until you sat down. Now you're even more grateful for this port in the storm. Though the inn and tavern are relatively small, the rain seems miles away within this cocoon of warmth and welcome. Just as the innkeeper plants a mug before you, the door to the inn swings wide, and a flash of lightning without illuminates a figure in the doorway. Happy words of welcome greet her, a dark-haired lady who looks to be of high birth by her dress and manner. She sits down straight away at a table very near the fire, which illuminates her features plainly. About her neck is a deep green amulet wrought with a silver chain. As the room fills, guests entering from the rain or coming down from their rooms 
There's a fair bit of shifting glances as you take each other in. Not surprisingly, the innkeeper remarks that it's the fullest his place has been on a given night in many years. And with all sorts of people, and what a delight. Just last evening, he was here alone in the bar room while Mary made pies in the kitchen for no one to eat. Just me, my Mary and the cat it was, he says, to no one in particular. The food he brings you is hearty and delicious, seeming to feed your very soul. You feel stronger, more resilient and energized, as opposed to the road-worn self you first dragged through the door. And those around you clearly perk up after a few bites, too, as if there's some magic seasoning sprinkled in the pie crust and stew that wakens the heart and stirs courage. Soon, the quiet conversations, isolated between tables and traveling companions, begin to overlap. Heads turn, bodies lean back in chairs as guests begin to compare weather conditions, the obstacles they've met on the road, and the destinations in store for each party. Coincidentally, though perhaps this should not surprise you at all, you are in the company of a dozen or more others on their way to the same place as you. A festival honoring the crown prince's coming of age. The whispers throughout the kingdom, though they may be greatly distorted and exaggerated, suggest that the king regent will install his nephew upon the throne during the festivities. There are rumors that a lost heir to the old king's line has surfaced, and the king regent must act swiftly to secure his family's place, crowning the prince before all the public, so there's no question to the validity of his rule. By your measure, it's never much mattered who sat on the high throne of the kingdom. You answer mostly to the local lords, who provide protection and benefits in exchange for taxes and work. What draws you to the festival is a chance to sell your wares to a wealthier clientele and those who might find your crafts novel and exotic. You hail from the far southern tip of the kingdom, where the air is crisp and salty, and a mulberry tree grows that produces the richest and most elegant dyes. You're well respected in your region as a dyer of textiles and producer of fine pigments. With luck, you'll be able to sell bolts of fabric and wool to noble lords and ladies at court who've never worn such a lush palette of golds and greens. It seems every guest at the inn has a different reason for traveling to the king's festival. You learn that the trio of half-elves intend to seek an audience with the regent. They've long paid tribute to one of his dukes and wish to entreat him for sole sovereignty of their lands. The dwarf, whose surly expression melts to a serene one after a few mugs of ale, brings gifts for the crown prince, mined from the old mountains. Only the lady by the fire, about whose neck hangs the strange amulet, remains reticent with her motives. Though the hour grows late and bellies are full, the atmosphere in the tavern is so warm and companionable that no one seems eager to retire to bed. A twosome sitting in the corner near the kitchen reveal themselves to be traveling bards, and the rest of the guests persuade them to play a merry song for the gathering. It doesn't take much convincing for them to produce a harp and a flute 
and to begin playing a charming melody that floats in the background of continued conversation. The innkeeper is mightily pleased. How nice it would be, he remarks, to have such passing sweet music here all the year round. He learned that his name is Hal, and he and his wife, Mary, have owned and operated the inn for nearly twenty years now. Build it with me own hands, he insists, displaying his rough, calloused hands as proof that the crossing of the three great roads knew we'd always have guests from one way or another, though a night like this we don't see often. Get all types, mind you, just not always all at once. Hal's laughter is booming and infectious, and he has a way of coaxing stories out of even the shyest of guests. He longs to hear stories of the further duchies and petty kingdoms, or stories of the road. Hasn't anyone a tale of adventure or excitement to share? We have a tale to tell, ventures one of the three half-elves, the one named Aaron Brightbuckle. Her fellows give uneasy glances, but with a tilt of her head, she seems to reassure them that the company is trustworthy. A tale of strange occurrence on the road from the north. The fires blaze, and the pummeling rain form a curtain of fuzzy, crackling sound as the music ceases, and Brightbuckle begins her tale. It was three days ago we set off from our village, deep in the green forest. Our guide was the river Durindal, which flows southward to the edge of the wood, then breaks easterly. From time immemorial, a bridge has stood over the river just before its bend, leading to the king's road. But when we came to the forest's edge, we found the bridge had fallen into the river. Only a few stones remained with crumbling mortar. We know not how long it was in such disrepair, for our kind rarely leave the forest. And so, the story continues, this time the half-elf called Whistle picking up the thread and weaving the narrative. We followed the river east, hoping to come to another crossing, but by nightfall still we had found nothing, not a village or a footbridge or anything. We were ready to settle and make camp to continue searching in the morning when we saw a fire a little ways off. We drew our bows and approached the fire, a little thing only, and found, sitting beside it, a hermit in humble robes, with long silver hair and a beard that nearly reached the earth. Now the third half-elf, the one called Thorn, picks up the tale. When he saw us, he begged that we put away our weapons and join him at his fire. Stay a while, he beseeched us, and share a crust of bread, for the night was cold. We asked him if he knew of a crossing nearby, or of a harbor where we might find a boat. But he would not answer, only insisting that we sit with him a while and bring our warmth to the fire. At last, we put away our bows and acquiesced, for the old man seemed weary and hungry for company. But the moment we sat round the small, feeble fire, the flames leapt high into the air and turned every color of the rainbow in succession. The old man, seeming to swell from within, cast off his shabby cloak and rose to his feet, 
shining bright as the fire itself. He was grand now, robed in fine emerald threads, his tattered beard now smooth and shiny. In one hand he clutched a magnificent staff, and from the other came sparks and mist. We had to shield our eyes against his light, says Brightbuckle, reclaiming the tale. He was one of the old sorcerers of legend, I say, the ones they say left this realm for distant shores in the last age. He looked like a star fallen to the earth, grown wise and aged. In his eyes burned a blue intensity, and yet, through everything awesome and terrible about him, he smiled with a kindness that made us weep. For our act of compassion, a simple act of stopping to sit with a weary old man, he raised his staff to the sky and uttered an incantation I cannot repeat, for the words were in no tongue I've heard before and from the staff and gesture of his hand a twining of stone and mortar unfurled. Stone by stone, at his command, a bridge lay itself across the rushing river. It shone there in the moonlight, gleaming like gossamer. When we'd caught our breath and the gleam had faded, we found the old man gone, only embers left of the dying fire. Shaken as we were, we crossed the sorcerer's bridge, but on the other side, we found three newly fashioned bows of shining birch wood and quivers full of gleaming arrows, one for each of us. There is silence for a little while, save for only the sheets of rain on the windows and crackle of fire in the hearth. It's as if the story has cast a spell upon the unlikely gathering, as if the tale has struck each heart, whispered a secret in each ear. There are wide eyes all around, an audience held within the story's enchantment. You, one of the spellbound, feel a dreamy sense of deja vu, as if the half-elves had repeated an old folk tale, one you hearkened to in your youth, forgetting as you came of age. But then, you also had a mysterious encounter on the road hither, did you not? It's Hal who breaks the silence at last. Strange wonders lie on the road these days, I reckon, he says. Come to think of it, not a fortnight hence we had a visitor in these parts, a farmer, young one, just come of age, had a rather unique sword, as I recall, asking questions about dragons in the western mountains of all things. And wouldn't you know, Not a few days later, there's talk of a dragon sighted again, first time in living memory. This sends a bout of whispers across the tavern, blending into a natural susurration. Dragon sightings? Hermit sorcerers? These are marvelous times indeed. I, too, witnessed wondrous marvels on the road, comes a low, husky voice. It's the woman beside the fire, speaking at last. I was older then, when I left my village, she says, her tongue tracing the first of many riddles. Wiser, too. My neighbors came to me for charms and remedies, Potions and tinctures. I worked with the water and the moon and the plants and was called a wise woman. But before the harvest, a blight came. All the crops, 
of all the villagers and all the healing herbs in my garden withered and my magic with it. I left to seek an answer to the sudden dying of the land. They say the king regent receives counsel from a wise magician. Nothing like the sorcerers of the past, but a learned sage with wisdom of the cycles of the world. So it was of him I sought guidance. As the lady speaks, her raven dark curls in silhouette against the fire, you sense a presence at your feet. Peering discreetly under the table, you meet two bright green eyes. A cat, black with white paws and chest, winds its way around your leg gently butting its head against your shin. Then, swiftly deciding it's finished with you, the cat leaps away and into the lap of Mary, the innkeeper's wife, who now sits and hearkens to the tale. The lady continues, It was a perilous journey for a woman of my age. My bones were not what they once were, and they sorely ached as I traversed the land. Yet my quest spurred me on. Only I could save my home and the magic it held. You glance about the room, and the puzzled expressions of the other guests mirror your confusion. The storyteller appears to you in the prime of youth, and yet she speaks of old age and frailty. You listen on. On the second night of my travels, as I searched in vain for shelter, for the night and the moon rose full overhead, a sudden chill took me, and I could go no further. I sat beneath a hazel tree as the cold closed in, but as I sat and shivered, I felt at once a shower of warmth and light upon my face, then upon my shoulders and my whole body. By the light of the moon, a young man approached me, and from him seemed to come a glowing warmth that then enveloped me. He took me by the hand, and I rose to my feet as though I were weightless. I moved with a swiftness and an ease I had not known in years. I followed him through the wood, and it was as if we passed through a kind of veil. To another world, where the sun shines as though through a dense fog. In this strange country, the food tasted sweeter, and the earth yielded herbs I did not recognize. With each day I spent in his ethereal kingdom, I felt the months and years fall away. I grew younger each night and rose freshly each morning to a new kiss of youth. A year and a day I spent there in the other world, living among its people and learning to cultivate these strange herbs. At times I forgot the plight of my village, and indeed forgot that there was any world outside of this one. I knew love and friendship there, and I was cherished. But soon the cries of my people I heard upon the wind, and I knew I must depart and continue my journey. The people of the other world dressed me in fine clothing and wished me well. The beautiful man who brought me thither, a fairy man, I'm sure of it now, blessed me before I embarked. He gave me the gem you see here. And she gestures to the amulet around her neck, which glows with a rubious depth in the flickering fire. This gem, imbued with a charm of protection, would also safeguard the youth his land had restored to me. Should I ever remove it, 
he said. The years would swiftly return. When I passed from the fairy realm, I found that indeed no time had passed. But I was young again and eager to bring my findings to the king's mage. The lady's story hangs upon the warm tavern air like ice crystals melting on the skin. You feel a mixture of emotions toward her, a slow kindled tenderness and compassion, a feeling of protectiveness and concern for a woman traveling alone, carrying such a valuable item in plain sight, and also a sense of pity, for you never saw age as a weakness, but something to be admired. There's a wisdom in the lady's eyes that's unmatched by her countenance. Behind the stirring feelings also wakens a curiosity within you. The lady spoke of strange herbs in the world beyond this one, plants that do not grow on the green earth. You must speak with her further, for perhaps there are plants in the fairy realm that produce even rarer and more exotic dyes than the ones you peddle. Colors only dreamt of and never seen under the sun. A fairy man, you say, comes the voice of one of the bards. And was it the fairy country in which you passed the year, lady? I cannot offer proof, save for the certainty in my heart the lady replies. In that country, food was plentiful. All were eternally young, and illness and disease were unheard of. I might have stayed all my life, were I not called to a purpose in this world. There is great interest among the guests as to the location of the doorway to the other world. Even you harbor a longing to find the fairy country. But the lady insists she could not recall the way. A year in the company of the fay has blurred her memories of the path she walked. And even if she could find that hazel grove once more, the doors to other worlds rarely appear in the same place twice. At least, and the bards here agree. That's what the old songs say. In the wake of dragons, fairies, and sorcerers, at last you feel moved to tell your story of the road. You feel struck by the same poetic spirit, just as you were clearly visited upon by some similar strangeness. I have a tale to offer, you say your voice clearer and more musical than you remember. I, too, encountered a marvel on my journey. Hal pours another round for those guests who wish it. Your eyes focus on the hearth as you weave the tapestry of your tail. It was midday when the road from the south brought me to the edge of a dark wood, you begin. I was prepared for this, as those who have traveled to the castle before have brought back warnings of this place. It is a vast forest of confused and entwined paths, earning it the name of Tanglewood. At the utterance of its name, many of the guests around you nod or mutter sounds of familiarity with the wood. Many a traveler has become lost in Tanglewood, you continue, and dangers lurk in the shadows there. But I was unafraid when I entered. I made of the stories and songs of the wood a kind of protective shield. I wrapped myself in the rumors, for that was all they were, and turned the dangers back upon themselves with every step. But the wood was dark. 
The afternoon sun strained to reach between the brambles, and the path was winding and difficult to follow in the dim light. My resolve began to fade and my invisible shield of songs and stories with it. With every snap of a twig or sound of a scurrying creature through the trees, I became afraid. I worried I would lose my way and be lost in Tanglewood forever. But as I reached the densest part of the forest, and the canopy closed in, sealing out the last of the sunlight, I perceived a silver glow straight ahead through the trees. It was bright as the harvest moon and almost seemed to sing, to hum toward me. Indeed, it seemed to me that I could hear in that quivering song of the silver light my name upon the lips of a gifted bard. It called to me. And so I followed it, this gasp of light in a forest of darkness. My eyes and feet found clarity in the path, and the light guided me onward through the thicket. The faster I moved toward it, the more it pulled away, as though I were chasing a playful child. Finally, the traveling light slowed, allowing me to reach it. And when I was close enough for my eyes to grasp the detail, I discovered that at the center of the glow was an animal. It was a white heart, generating this abundant light. The creature was so beautiful, an expression of such profound innocence, that I nearly wept at the sight of it. I was so spellbound by its loveliness that I did not at first notice its injury. But there, in its hind leg, was an arrow. The poor creature was wounded, and yet it still led me safely through the wood with its light. So I endeavored to help the creature. I carefully removed the arrow and dressed its wound with a scrap of fabric from my pack. I hoped that this small gesture would convey my gratitude to the heart. Then, to my surprise, the wounded heart began to transform before my eyes. Its shining coat became skin, its forelegs stretched outward into arms, and its body stood upright. Before me, there was no more a heart but a child with moon-white hair and a clean, white shift. She looked no older than seven or eight, but as I beheld her, it seemed she flickered between multiple states, as those superimposed here with the pale image of a grown woman, and there with the spectral form of a crone. Briefly, she was all three at once, but as my eyes grasped for the full picture of her, she returned, solidly, to the little child, barefoot in the dark forest. She stayed by my side and walked with me till we reached the far edge of Tangle Wood. And there, before we parted, she insisted I accept a gift. Then she plucked three platinum hairs from her head and sealed them in a small glass jar, which I now carry close to my heart. It is like bottled starlight, she said, and I only need open the jar when I find myself lost in the dark. Her gift will always light my way. Even now, as you conclude your tale, you can feel the presence of the tiny jar in your breast pocket, your bottle of starlight. With your words on the air and your story in the minds of others, you feel a rush of amity, of fellowship. It's as though by offering your tale, like a kind of communion, you formed a sacred bond of kinship with the people in this room. 
you have exchanged memories and marvels, creating an intimate community of travelers and storytellers. Many an hour passes before anyone is ready to retire to their rooms. Guests change their seats and tables are pushed together, moving close to new friends who were perfect strangers not moments ago. Hal and Mary beam at the new connections made under their roof. Before the night is over, you have shared a toast with Brightbuckle and the wise woman, and you have resolved to go forth together as a company to the king's festival. The storm is quieting outside the inn, the rain only a gentle pitter-patter against the windows. At last, the ache and weariness of long travel overpowers the exhilaration of new friendships and discovery. The harper in the corner is lazily picking at the strings, composing out loud a song of powerful hermits, fairy kings, and magical hearts. Dragons in the night sky. Arranging to meet your party at first light to set off toward the castle, you bid Hal and Mary a grateful good night and make your way up to the chamber. One by one, you extinguish the lamps. You shuffle carefully to the bed, feeling for obstacles in the darkness. There's a small window by the bed, against which beats the last gasp of the evening's rain. Gray clouds obscure the stars and the moon tonight. But it's all right, you think, settling into the soft embrace of the mattress and letting the night's darkness close around you like a blanket. You've got starlight at your fingertips. You awaken to the tingly scents of tamarack and pine, loftily penetrating the chilly air. You pull the blankets closer around you to ward off the damp, dewy morning. Slate gray early morning sun slices through the opening to the shallow cave you've called home for these several nights. Where once you doubted you'd find comfort or rest, but have instead slept the deepest slumbers of your life. Oh, and what extraordinary dreams you've dreamt in this place. How vast and deep the worlds you've plumbed in that rich sleep. Some nights you've seemed to travel on night's wings throughout her midnight hunt, the moon on your scales. Some nights you've sailed on distant seas, whipped by waves unending. You shut your eyes tight now, holding fast to the details of the particularly vivid dream from which you've just awoken. In the dream, you were lost in a strange and enchanted wood in the deep of night. It seemed to you that it sparkled with threads of magic, and that each time you turned to look closely at the threads, they vanished in a kind of coy dance. And through the trees in time there was a bright burning light, like constant fire, and you drew toward the light with your sword drawn and your mind sharp, ready to defend yourself. You came to the source of the light, a small clearing, 
where the sun was shining bright as midday, although the woods around you still slumbered under a midnight moon. And there in the clearing you saw a struggle underway between a dragon and a lion. At first you only watched as they fought with fire and claw and tooth and tail. But when you realized that the dragon, the magnificent dragon, was losing to the lion, you felt compelled to leap to its defense. Your sword sang as it slashed through the air and it cleaved the lion's tail in two. There was a flash of golden humming light, which for a moment nearly blinded you. But as you squinted through the days you thought you could see, standing behind the lion, another you, a reflection cast by some unseen mirror, ringed in light and bearing a sword, very like yours, but not the same. This other you fell to kneel beside the wounded lion and stroked its mane and uttered words of comfort. It was when you turned in the dream to tend to the dragon that you awoke. Now, as you try in vain to return your body and mind to its sleepy state, there comes on the breeze a great, thundering whoosh the sound of wings. It's as if she knows you're awake. When you emerge from the small cave, cloak draped around your shoulders and breath misty on the air, she's perched precipitously upon the jutting rocks, eyes bright. The marvelous dragon, night by name, all but gleams in the dull morning sun, her crimson scales more lustrous than ever before. Fresh air and freedom have done her good. When you found her, she was chained up deep in the caverns of Mount Arden, thin and in poor health. If she looked beautiful to you then, she is divine now. Though you've traveled together for mere weeks, Soaring over vast oceans and mountain peaks, you and the dragon have a fierce bond forged in infancy. Just over a year ago, you learned a secret that transformed your life, that you were not, as you had always believed, the child of a farming family, but the lost heir to the throne of the kingdom you were spirited away when a rebellion deposed the king and hidden in the home of a loving family who raised you far from the burdens of your royal destiny. On your journey to discover who you truly are, you sought out the fearsome dragon of Mount Arden. When, however, you arrived, the truth unfolded Night was not a foe to be vanquished, but a friend, an ally with a shared history. You learned that she hatched from her egg on the day you were born, that you and she were bonded from birth and meant to grow up together. Dragons were the symbol of your royal house, and the auspices declared your fates were intertwined. But this bond, this kinship, was cut short in the turmoil that followed. You and Knight were separated, and the kingdom torn asunder. You have to believe that something greater than coincidence or chance brought you back together. For the last year, since you learned of your true heritage, you've often felt like a bead of dew sliding along the strings of fate, inevitably sliding toward night, the oldest friend you can't remember.
and perhaps also toward your inheritance, the throne. Perhaps is a word you've used many times since your reunion. For the closer you've come to grasping that inheritance, the more uncertain you've become. Do you really have the ambition to take the throne and lead a kingdom? Do you have what it takes, dragons or not, to challenge the king regent, knowing it might lead to open war? Are you ready to consign your dragon so long locked away in chains to the limitations of courtly existence when she's only just tasted freedom? So, hidden since birth even without knowing it, you suppose you are now in a kind of self-imposed hiding while you determine your next move. Exile might be a better word for it. Exile conjures up noble associations, while hiding sounds sheepish and undignified. But ah, there's more to this withdrawal from civilization than mere avoidance. Here among the pines, the rocky cliffs and mountains, you've found a connection to the earth a freshness in the wind, and a purity of energy you could hardly have anticipated. You have half a mind to remain here, dreaming your vasty dreams, letting night hunt, unfettered, forever. Her voice, with the merest suggestion of reptilian growl, cuts through the jumbled discord of your thoughts with the most simple, welcome invitation. Hungry. Your stomach answers with a hearty growl. And so you set about preparing breakfast from what night has brought. These forested mounts have proven fecund and fruitful, with wild game aplenty and flowering plants to provide ample nourishment. Soon after, bellies full and minds the clearer for it, you and the splendid dragon survey this, your kingdom for the time being. This remote, unpopulated, and yet breathtaking region where wild things grow knowing nothing of the doings at court. Your hair, which grows long after months of aimless travel, is tied atop your head, and the breeze plays across your cheeks with a whisper of winter. It comes quickly this high among the clouds. Should you climb or fly to the summit, surely even now you'd find flurries of snow which those in the capital won't see for months yet. Out across land and sea, you fix your gaze upon the sparkling horizon. And there, or even just beyond, you glimpse a faint and unsteady sparkle. Is it, you wonder, the glimmer of that distant kingdom, the one over which you should rightly reign, You've never beheld the castle or the keep. You know nothing of the people who live within its walls. And yet, somewhere in the recesses of your mind, you trace a map of its magnificent halls and alleys. There is a future, a life, upon that horizon, which was taken from you. You're thinking about the castle again, says the dragon at your side, her voice calm and comforting. You let go a deep exhale. There are no secrets you've learned from her. 
It's as if she can see inside your mind. In the time you've been together, you've learned to accept this, or at least not to let it concern you. There's something reassuring even to have another being affirm your deepest thoughts and desires, reflect them back to you like a mirror, and help you carve a path forward. It's a lovely morning, you say, unprepared to engage with questions of the throne. You know little of this country, in the mountains of which you've made your camp. The nearest inhabited village is miles below and beyond. You needed a place where night could hunt and fly without being constantly sighted. Of course, given her size, there's a certain risk of that that's unavoidable. It brings a smile to your lips to think of children in that far-off village glimpsing the winged wonder at dusk and how the vision might set their hearts alight as it did yours. It's been so long since dragons were seen on these shores. But it's more than just the seclusion that brought you to this region. There's something about it you can't quite explain. It's as if the vibrations here are different, more alive, more electrifying. Just as when you sleep, you sleep deeper than ever before. When you're awake, you feel more awake invigorated and in tune with the invisible forces that surround you. The wind here wakes your senses and straightens your spine. Where you were raised, magic was a relic of a bygone age, a memory passing into myth. But here, enchantment seems to infuse the rocks and waters and sky, enlivening the atmosphere. It feels immediate, tangible. Something drew you here, across half the world, a presence in the bones of the earth. Strange herbs grow on these mountain peaks, and they sting the air with stimulating scents, sharpening the senses. One grows on the east side of the mountain, the likes of which you've never seen. When the wind streams through patches of the plant, it produces an intoxicating perfume. When burned, you've discovered the smoke offers a scent even more entrancing, inducing a state of intense relaxation. After breakfast, you practice for a time with your sword. Having a fire-breathing dragon at your beck and call affords you some indulgence when it comes to honing your combat skills but you've decided it's necessary to master some basic techniques. Night observes lazily, half amused by your self-taught flourishes. Before leaving your village, you trained briefly in swordsmanship and agility, using the rustic blade forged for you by the town blacksmith. You build slowly upon this foundation, sometimes wishing you had the expert guidance of a swordmaster. Still, just to feel the blade slice through the air and to move your body with precise intention is of immense value. It's like dancing, you think. Your feet shuffle across the rocks and your sword arm follows the momentum built through your base and core. You twist round, 
and bring the blade cleanly downward in a powerful slashing, all in the space of a moment. Something triggers. It's like a bolt of lightning, a bright sensation throughout your body as a dormant part of your mind wakes up. All at once, though your sword cuts only through thin air it meets, you sense resistance, as though it's coming up against something solid. You reel backward into your dream from last night, the dream in which you rescued a dragon from a lion's attack. For only an instant, it's like you're there, in the clearing in the enchanted wood, and yet you're also here, atop a windy peak in unknown country. When at last your body and mind relax, settling back into the lucid awareness of your where and when, you look to night, who regards you with an unmistakable expression, one of absolute understanding. She felt it too, you realize. She was there in the wood with you, There's a fierce vitality in the atmosphere between you and the dragon, like an invisible tether that connects your hearts and minds. Your breathing returns to normal, but you can sense your inhale and exhale coming into alignment with night. It's a while before either of you speaks. Night, you venture. The king regent. What is the symbol of his house? You wait for the dragon to respond, but you already know the answer. The lion, she says, bringing into speech that which already rings in your heart. A cloud moves over the late morning sun, bringing a sudden chill to the skies and goosebumps to the flesh on your arms. There is more, you think, in the recesses of your memory, the limitless depths of your subconscious than you knew. In your mind's eye, the surreal adventure of your dream, a dark wood, a mythic conflict, a mirror image of you protecting the lion swirls and flashes with more concrete images. A dragon banner flying over a stone castle and an instant later in tatters. A new flag bearing the herald of a rampant lion with a double tail. The clank and clamor of sword on sword. The shouting of soldiers and the drawing of doors. It all comes on with utter and immense clarity in contrast to the languorous pace of the dream vision. You were only a baby when you were removed from court. It's impossible to think that what you see are memories of the rebellion. And yet, the images are so vivid, so detailed, that they feel real enough to step into. How can this be, you wonder, unless... The realization comes delicately, not like the lightning bolt, but more so the soft melting and absorption of frost into thawing soil. Dreams, 
memories, thought, the connection you feel tonight, the splendid dragon, goes deeper than kin, deeper than blood. Your minds are linked, almost as one being. Something about this place, it seems, has amplified the connection, brought it to the surface, stirred your dreams and visions into one. It's only now that you realize you've fallen to the ground, knocked, as it were, off your feet by the force of the vision. Night all monstrously magnificent against the pale afternoon, towers over you, her reptilian face caught in an expression of concern and sympathy. Did that come from you? You ask, your voice calmer than you expect it to be. The fighting, the castle. Yes. Night responds, and the lion, the forest, did that come from you? Yes, you say. The air hums, the rustle of leaves from the trees in the valley below swells to a whispering crescendo. High upon a mountain above the pines and mist, your entire consciousness shifts. It is a curious thing, a wondrous thing you discover, to share thoughts with another in this world. Atop the world, here in your hermitage, you and night plumb the depths of each other's minds, learning the curves and channels of the space between you and sending messages along those strings, like dew on spiders' webs pushed forth with only the force of thought. You recruit energy from the ringing atmosphere, shaping the images deep in your mind into coherent streams and sending them forth. This becomes a daily practice between you. The days pass much as they did before. You rise early, share a meal, practice your sword play, and ride your dragon over the peaks on the hunt for food and firewood. But now, at liminal times, midday, twilight, when the quality of light seems a portal to other worlds, you and night burn the hypnotically scented herbs and meditate together, exploring the threads of your newfound psychic bond crafting messages to send to each other. In time, you learn much of your own past, seen through night's eyes as though they are your own. You witness the doting attention of the old king and queen, your parents, the revelry of court and soon the downfall of the dynasty. Then you fully inhabit the dragon's experience of imprisonment in the depths of a cave, cultivating an even more potent foundation of empathy. Night in turn sees fields of grain for the first time, accompanying you through the quiet, yet comforting mundanity of adolescence on the farm. You package memories like little gifts and send them along invisible strings, firmly tied to your respective souls. 
you receive them with gratitude and humility, not knowing how or why you came by this connection, but feeling all the time that it is natural, inevitable even. Your hatchlings, after all, kin, and it seems soulmates. Indeed, the nexus is so strong, so palpable, that at times, during your meditation sessions, you become helplessly entangled in the network of thoughts, dreams, and memory. There are moments, fleeting but frequent, in which your mind and nights are utterly indistinguishable. You forget briefly where you end and the dragon begins. You can almost feel your belly as a tinderbox or the shelter of a tiny ember, a spark of magnificent fire. You feel strong, imposing, and above all, empowered. Does the dragon experience this, you wonder, this passing confusion of embodied experience? As your new abilities grow and develop, so does the moon. It waxes fuller each night, swelling as if with the gathered energy of your work. As it gradually nears its fullest expression, the mountain peaks almost seem to vibrate with potential. Something new and exhilarating is within your grasp. You can feel it. And so can night. You can't put it into words just yet, or even into abstract understanding but you know you are on the precipice of something. Tonight, then, you determine, at midnight, underneath the full moon, we'll cross whatever threshold we discover. You choose midnight, of course, because it is the most enigmatic hour when mysteries might be revealed because the moon will be high, and because it is the very essence of your dragon's namesake. Midnight is a doorway. The hour soon approaches, and the moon does rise, swollen and veiled, honey gold overhead. You make a small pile of the exotic herbs, The foliage leaves an oily residue on your fingers. This you massage into the dry skin of your hands, which drink it in gratefully. Night breathes a controlled stream of fire onto the pile, and the leaves immediately ignite, curling in on themselves and glistening with red-hot embers. Smoke travels on elegant, irregular spirals through the chilly darkness, only mildly troubled by a mild dancing breeze. And the fragrance makes its way effortlessly to your nose. It's a mystifying blend of accords, one you've ached to separate and identify for there's both exoticism and deep familiarity in its notes. Your closest guess calls on the warm musk of night-fragrant jasmine and an uplifting descant of peppermint or myrtle. Whatever it is, the effect is intoxicating and instantaneous, Seated with your legs comfortably crossed, you feel your shoulders drop away from your ears and down your back. 
Your jaw unclenches and your brow unfurrows. All the tiny, unacknowledged muscles of your face that once make themselves known to you and then melt into absolute relaxation. Your hips and tailbone, too, find solid support in the earth, rooting you into the matrix of the physical world. All this, your embodied self, succumbs to forces tugging downward, inward, and at the same time, ah, lightness, your consciousness, your soul even, exhales upward and outward. You feel both grounded and unleashed, wild and free. And this is only the beginning, the centering of the self within the ritual. There is another, a partner, and the connection must be forged. With weeks of practice, you and Knight have refined a process for initiating the psychic bond. It's a process of casting, almost as a fisher casts his line out to sea with a specialized target in mind. Individually, you and the dragon bind and focus on an especially powerful and specific thought an image, or a memory, or a symbol from a dream. And once it's firmly established in your own mind, so full and authentically realized that it would be recognizable anywhere, you cast it forth toward your partner. It's an action entirely powered by mental energy and intention. At the same time, you imagine and manifest a thread, an invisible string, with one end tied to the thought you're sending and one end tied to you. The message acts then like an anchor in the mind of the other, only to be retrieved when the ritual concludes. As the process begins tonight, under the corn yellow moon, you search for an initiatory image or thought to send tonight as your anchor. It comes like a wind now. It's small, unremarkable, seemingly insignificant, but it feels right. You see a field of barley subtly asway in the golden liquid light of late afternoon. You feel yourself moving slowly through the field, your outstretched hand just grazing the soft, tickly tendrils of the grain. It feels like home and untapped potential and intuition. It brings you back to a past self who knew nothing of royal lineage or ambition or kinship with dragons, but who dreamed of magical things with limitless fervor. This is what you cast like a fishing line to your hatchling, your sister, your dragon. This is your anchor. And as you cast it forward, you receive a message. It lands lightly in your mind, flooding you first with only emotion, comfort, contentment. And then it takes shape as image and sensation. You see through dragon's eyes a castle window through which streams the light of a moon so like tonight's 
You watch how the moonlight plays across flagstone floors and gently across the gauzy ivory fabric of a canopy drawn close around what must be a cradle. You feel warm and sleepy, but also endowed with great and worthy responsibility. You feel like a protector. The invisible tethers hum like the strings of a lyre plucked on a pleasing harmony. The connection is made. It's tempting to practice as you always have, but you both know that tonight is different, that you have mastered and moved beyond the foundations of casting, the sending and receiving of messages. The tether feels stronger tonight, perhaps amplified by the midnight moon or by the strength and specificity of your anchors. But you have the sense, call it intuition or whatever you will, that if you want it, you could step out onto the invisible string, gather up your balance, and walk across it. And so you do. With the full presence and energy of your mind, galvanized by the mesmeric fragrance of the herbs, you leave your body and move, slowly and with unwavering intention, across the line you've cast. You know somehow that night is doing the same. Two beads of dew sliding along the strings of fate. And then there you are, hardly conscious of the effort it took or of the gravity of the feet. You are back in a body, but it is not your body. It is muscle and bone and scale and horn, imposing and empowered. You feel the weight of organic armor pulling you downward, and you know that any step you take would create a thunder in the earth. But you also feel the presence of your wings. Ah, they are a relief indeed and their mere existence lightens you, makes you feel one with the stars. At length you open your eyes, and you look upon your own face through the wisps of perfumed smoke. How uncanny it is to see yourself through another's eyes, by virtue perhaps of the perspective You look with a tenderness and indulgence you've rarely applied to yourself. You've been so quick to self-judgment, you now realize. You really are a creature of wonder and beauty. The eyes across the fire open your eyes but not. Night regards you through them. For a moment, you both seem to stifle a laugh. Whether it's amusement, shock, or pure ecstasy, you can't say. But then the initial butterflies subside, and you settle. Breathe into the exchange. You hardly want to move for fear of breaking the tether accidentally and losing your pathway back to your body. But you breathe, and you listen, and you observe. 
Bonds like these are not so easily broken, says a voice in your head. You're not sure whose voice it is, night's or your own. It doesn't matter. You've both had the same thought. As long as the fire burns, and as long as you intend it to, the connection will remain intact. And now a seed has been planted in your mind, though you don't know by whom. A delightful, impossible, and mischievous seed. Your gaze across the fire doesn't waver. The face you thought was yours nods almost imperceptibly in response. Go, says the unknown voice. Fly. And fly you do. Without hesitation, you dig your hind claws into the clay and push away from the earth with a force you've never known. Your wings unfold, and first you flap them wildly, unsure how to proceed. It's not long, however, before you find an equalizing pressure in the atmosphere, a stream of air that buoys you from below and stabilizes you from above. You stretch your wings wide and feel the invigorating flux of night air around you, almost enveloping you as you move through it. Your nostrils flare, and oh, how the cool air streams down your throat, massaging you inside and out. You feel awake and alive, and also relaxed, unencumbered. You are a dragon. You're a dragon. Deep in your belly resides a tiny flame, an engine that propels you through the cloudless sky. The stars blink in endless sweeps and multitudes. You ride the waves of the wind. Within minutes, flight is as natural to you as breathing. Exhilaration ignites and swells within you, kindling the tiny flame until you must let it escape. You release a torrent of fire across the open sky. It makes you feel powerful and creative. There's no will to destroy in this fire, only to create, to spark, to move forward. People fear fire, you think, often rightly so. But in that fear of destruction, it's easy to miss that generative aspect of fire, how it releases new substances as it forms, how it makes possible radical and necessary change. Far below among the peaks, your home body is an anchor flying you like a kite, patiently awaiting your return. And as the moonlight graces your crimson scales, you can almost feel a million more little invisible strings connecting you to all the souls, all the spirits, all the infinite wisdom of the universe. They bind you sweetly to all memory, all myth, all possibility. Briefly, in a kind of sublime incandescence, you can see the future. 
and you will master this new and exciting gift such that on a moment's notice and with little effort, you will be able to exchange your consciousness with your dragon. That you will be each other's anchors from here on out, each other's homes, and that you will claim your rightful throne one day, but not through force or fire or the swing of a sword. You were never one for conquest, dragon or no. If the kingdom won't be won through kindness, mercy and justice, then it won't be won at all. Somewhere, another is being groomed for the throne. Someone so much like you. Their allegiance may be to the lion instead of the dragon, but they are still just like you. Flawed, well-intentioned, capable of forgiveness and mercy. You'll touch down soon and walk again across the invisible string to re-inhabit your body, no doubt finding it more cozy and welcoming than ever before. But for just a little while longer, you'll stay afloat. You'll breathe fire. You'll fly on the wings of night. In the shy light of morning, you descend the steps of the inn to meet your new companions. Only a night, the deep and heavy slumber of a weary traveler has passed since last you looked upon them by the light of the tavern fire. Yet it feels like ages have elapsed. Down in the tavern, where only hours ago you rushed in out of the storm, where you shared stories round the fire with relative strangers, the innkeeper, Hal, is sweeping the floors. He looks up to see you, his ruddy face breaking into a smile. He'd happily rustle up something to break your fast, if you'd like. His wife, Mary, is the cook, and she's always got a good hunk of rye or wheel of cheese lying around. You thank him sincerely for the hospitality, but has he seen the folks with whom you were conversing yesterday evening? You're meant to meet them any minute now. Of course, he says, the fine-dressed lady and the three from the green forest already came down and took as much food as they could hold in their packs they did. He laughs heartily. They haven't gone, have they? You ask, crestfallen. Oh, no, no, Hal replies. Just gone to look around the town, they said. I promised I'd send you on your way as soon as I saw you. You sigh with relief. You didn't think you'd overslept so much graciously accepting another pack full of bread from Hal, you hoist your traveling bag over a shoulder and depart the inn. You give it a backward glance as you go, cherishing the memories you made within its cozy, firelit embrace. Shelter, it was, in a storm. Now you go forth into a sunny day to find your new friends, 
The inn sits at the crossing of the three great roads, and a little village has sprung up in the cradle of the convergence. You stroll down the main corridor through the tiny shops and trades, though the feel and climate of this region are very different from your home in the southernmost tip of the kingdom. You find that the village doesn't diverge much from the ones you know. Like every small town and large city in the south, it has a blacksmith, a general store, and various market stalls for hawkers of different wares. In the near distance, toward the foothills of the western mountain range, which forms a steady ridge across the horizon, you can see a smattering of residences. You wind through the sleepy marketplace where merchants are just beginning to set up for the day. If you had nowhere to be, no obligations, and no companions waiting for you, you'd feel quite at home here. You'd find an empty stall and barter for the space to set up shop and sell your products. Your bag is packed full of bolts of richly dyed fabrics, wool and silk imbued with the finest green and gold pigments imaginable, made from special dyes only found in the South. You might make a pretty penny hawking them here, but you do have people waiting for you. And besides, you're saving the bolts to sell at the king's magnificent festival, where they're sure to catch the eye of the nobles at court. You find some of your party in the village square, the trio of half-elves, bright buckle, whistle and thorn, are gathered conversing by the fountain. They wave you over when they see you, Each wears a bow and quiver of arrows over their shoulder. Only now, by the light of day, do you notice the heraldic insignia on each of their garments. A white tree with half its branches in bloom as if at the height of summer and the other half bare as in the coldest months of winter. You'll have to ask them sooner or later about the meaning of this symbol and whether it indicates their belonging to some order or other. But for now, only one question rises to your lips regarding the whereabouts of the final member of your traveling party. Gone to acquire some more appropriate travel threads, says Brightbuckle the most outgoing of the half-elves, with a chuckle. Morana, the lady in question, whose noble attire raised more than a few eyebrows at last night's gathering in the inn, is wise to exchange her fine silks for something less conspicuous. At least now, she won't be traveling alone. Well, you suppose... If there's time to kill, you might dip into one of the shops lining the village square. The half-elves promise to come find you when Marana returns, so you can at last embark on your journey down the King's Road. There's one establishment in particular that's caught your eye. A painted sign hangs outside the door, swaying slightly in the breeze. Depicted upon it is the skull of a deer. It's hard to explain, but you feel you must go inside. The moment you swing the door open, even before you can cross the threshold, you are overcome with the smell of incense. Clouds of smoke rise to meet you, obscuring your vision, so that it's almost as if you step into a thickening void. When the smoke clears enough for you to see, 
You take in shelves and shelves of esoteric objects and arcane items, instruments the likes of which you've never seen, stones and crystals precisely arranged, talismans and amulets. This, you think, is a place of magic, the domain of sorcerers and mages, It's not a place where you should tarry long. But before you can turn and make for the door, a voice chimes through the clouds of smoke. Going so soon, it says, lingering like the woodsy herbal fragrance of the incense, before you've heard what the bones have to say. She's seated in the corner, at a table strewn with tiny objects, feathers, stones, coins, and bones. They're scattered with a chaotic randomness that nevertheless seems spiral in nature. You have a greater destiny, says the old woman in the corner, a stranger fate than you imagine. The realm awakens once more to an ancient enchantment. You have a choice to stay asleep, content with your lot, or to rise with the magic, to turn the world toward a kinder path. Maybe it's the hypnotic fragrance of the shop, or the occult atmosphere, or the vague and enthralling words of the woman, but your head seems to swim. You feel as if something within you is stirring, slowly, a part of you that's been asleep. That subdued part slowly lifts its head and perks up its ears to hear the message of the fortune teller the bone caster. But as soon as you become receptive to her message, the door of the shop swings open with the tinkling of bells. Your inner self lowers its head and succumbs to sleep again. It's like a veil is lifted, and with it the clouds of incense part letting the sunlight stream in through the open door. The mystical atmosphere subsides, like a dream dissipating in a dreamer's memory as they wake. Silhouetted in the doorway is Brightbuckle, the half-elf. Behind her are three others, the rest of your party, including Morana the lady, now clad in peasant's garb. As you exit the shop, even in your haste, you can hear the bone caster calling something after you. The horn, she cries. Find the hunting horn. Soon, shaking free of the somnolent whispers of the magic shop, You and your complete party reach the outskirts of the little village and behold a crossroads, the widest path, the king's road, stretches far ahead, snaking through the valley. Another road, rough and neglected, leads directly into the foothills. The last, off to the east, You and your party regard each other, so lately strangers, now bonded companions. Onward you travel, down the king's road, toward the festival, toward whatever may lie on the path. To break the monotony of the road, and as a cautious means of strengthening your newfound fellowship, You share stories and myths 
from your respective homelands. That such disparate places and cultures should exist within the boundaries of one realm, united under one throne, may not surprise you, but it's a boundless source of intrigue and curiosity. The half-elves hail from the forested regions of the north, their hamlet hidden so deep amid the labyrinth of trees that they rarely meet outsiders. They like it that way for the most part. Secrecy is key to their safety. But such isolation means they're unaccustomed to open spaces, crossroads, oceans and mountains. Their myths and legends are all of forest gods and creatures. The only regular contact they have with the rest of the world is a tenuous relationship with one of the king regent's dukes who sends frequent emissaries into their midst to collect tribute. Where you come from, a port city on the edge of the great sea, there are local legends of aquatic spirits and ocean gods. But the constant flow of goods and people into the port from all over the known world creates a wonderful exchange of lore and history. Morana, who was known in her home village as a healer and wise woman, is a fascinating storehouse of natural wisdom. She knows the names of all the flowers, plants, and trees along the road. It seems each has a legend connected with it, a deep symbolic significance, and a number of mystical properties. Morana points out a wild-growing vine that winds its way around the trunk of a tree It has trumpet-shaped flowers with an intense violet hue. It's sacred to the moon goddess, she explains, and the flowers can be made into a tea to induce peaceful slumber. It's a tricky flower to work with, however, for unless the dose is exactly right, the sleeper might dream for days for weeks on end, waking only at the ringing of a bronze bell. That's why I always keep a bell on hand, she continues, though I'm skilled enough to avoid the ill side effects in the first place. You learn much, even through idle chatter from your new friends, With all the vast cultural differences between you, there are also deep similarities in the stories you tell. Your gods and heroes have different names, but they are honored at similar times of the year, and their tales ring with echoing themes. With each story, you can feel the distance between your faraway homes shrink just a bit, as you come closer together. As the road winds through stranger and stranger country, you are grateful for their presence, for the strength that comes in numbers, for the joy that sings through the bonds of friendship, and for the genuine concern each of you has for the next. In this wide world, you think, there's no need to walk alone. You hope to come to another town by nightfall, but the longer you walk, the more remote the road becomes. It's surprising. You'd assumed that as you drew nearer the capital, you'd find more densely populated areas Instead, as a purple dusk falls over the land, 
The road twists into a wooded region. You and the Lady Marana are reasonably hesitant to enter the woods just as darkness falls. You've both had your own strange encounters in the forest by night. You suggest setting up camp for the night. You've supplies between you to make a comfortable place, and you can take turns on the night watch. But the half-elves, Bright Buckle, Whistle, and Thorn, bravely trudge ahead. They can see exceedingly well in the dark and are well acquainted with any dangers you might encounter in the forest. They're equipped with elegant new bows with which to defend you. And besides, you'll have better protection if you camp amid the trees than by the side of the open road, they insist. With some persuasion, your reservations are assuaged, and you follow the intrepid trio into the wood. There's a friendliness to the atmosphere you find. You've walked through other wild woodlands, feeling ill at ease. But here, the road is clear before you, and the moonlight sparkles on the trees with an inviting quality. Your companions sense this too, where before they walked cautiously, bows drawn. Now they lower their weapons and move with confidence. On many a tree, the same purple flowers wink on the vine, turning their brilliant heads to the moon. They produce a sweet, hypnotic musk. Noticing that a sleepy haze seems to settle around you, a pleasant, dreamy serenity, you ask Marana if it's possible for just the fragrance of the flower to have a hypnagogic effect. She nods wisely, especially under the light of the moon. The perfume of such a high volume of the flowers can certainly make one drowsy, though it won't put you entirely to sleep. She feels it too, as it happens. So do Brightbuckle and company. Across the faces of all your party are mild expressions of tranquil bliss. You begin to think it might be time to make camp. But it's just as you're seeking out a suitable clearing in the trees with space to build a fire and spread out bedrolls that you stumble upon a most unexpected sight. A garden. Lush and overgrown, yes, but with such impeccable grace and beauty by the light of the moon that it's impossible to think it merely an untended explosion of flowers and herbs in the deep forest. Your eyes follow its winding cascades of pink and yellow flowers, speckled here and there with twitching green moths, to its end, where, almost enclosed by hedges and camouflaged with climbing ivy, there is a small, twinkling cottage. Amber light flickers through the windows. A fire is lit within. You and your companions move in closer to one another, unsure how to proceed. It's an eerie thing to chance upon, and yet, and you can sense the same in your comrades. You feel a sense of utter calm. Perhaps it's the presence of such natural beauty flourishing under the moon or some other enchantment that lulls you into feeling absolutely at ease. 
It's funny, says Brightbuckle, but I seem to know this place. It's like, well, doesn't it feel like being at home? I was going to say the same, Morana replies. And I, you add, perhaps the steward of this friendly place might spare a cup of wine or offer shelter for the night to a band of weary travelers. It's now that you can perceive something moving above the hedges, the bouncing tip of a pointed hat, jolly in its motion. Someone is out among the rows, it seems, perhaps pruning the hedges or enjoying a stroll through their garden by the light of the moon. There's a tune, too, above the hum of insects, the sound of someone softly singing as they work as you and your company cautiously start down the garden path, the owner of the hat emerges into your line of sight. Two bright, sparkling eyes and an infectious grin shine behind a long gray beard. A more ancient person you're not sure you've ever seen with such joy beams from his presence that you feel light, childish at heart. Who goes there? Comes a low and musical voice. Begging your pardon, sir, you venture, stepping out ahead of your friends. We are travelers from distant lands meaning you no injury or ambush. We stumbled by chance into your garden and wonder if you might have space at your table for us. The bushy eyebrows raise a look of whimsy and interest in the bright eyes. It's now as you draw closer to the tall, wizened gardener that you recognize the two pointed ears that protrude from beneath his cap. This might be, you think, a true elf, though you've never seen one before, and you'd thought they were long gone from these shores, their bloodline only preserved in the masses of half-elves, like your friend's. What tales survive of the true elves sing of their virtue and generosity. It was when they began to migrate to distant shores that the realm's troubles first began. The gardener's expression softens now into a pleasing smile. Always a crinkle of laughter lights up his eyes. I've not seen company for many an age, he says. I'd welcome you, all of you, at my hearth. You breathe a sigh of relief. The old elf seems genuinely pleased to host you. Brightbuckle, whistle, and thorn are abuzz with intrigued energy as he turns to lead you to his door. They've seen it too. He's a true elf. Beyond the hedges and the moon-facing flowers are the ivy-covered stone walls. You follow the gardener inside, revealing a warm and inviting cottage. You're reminded, strangely, of the magic shop in the village square but it's like you're looking in a kind of reverse mirror where the shop had a mysterious occult energy. This place resonates on a more benevolent level, like it's steeped in white magic. You can't quite explain it, but in the Lady Morana's eyes, you find a confirmation of your feelings. 
She seems quite at home here, in the hermitage hung with dried, sweet-smelling herbs and garlands of flowers. The ancient elf brings you steaming mugs of tea to drink. His supper table is large enough to fit you all comfortably, though you wonder at such a thing in a solitary creature's house. Morana inquires as to your kind host's name. The question seems to bring him delight, as if he hasn't had to answer it in many years, as if saying it for the first time or conjuring it from the vasty depths of his memory, he utters the name Lear. Over a nourishing meal, your host asks you for news of the world beyond the wood. You inform him that you're en route to a festival in the capital city where rumor has it, the king regent plans to crown his son before the public. There are whispers throughout the kingdom of the lost heir to the old king's throne, who must be coming of age, though no one can agree on where the youth might be, or whether they're even still alive. Lear nods and furrows his brow here and there as you speak. But these matters of kings and queens and disputes for the throne seem to him mere trifles. You imagine he's so old, has seen so many regimes rise and fall, that the latest political intrigue passes as a brief season the way the oldest trees in a forest, ringed around their centers a hundred times, might perceive a long and arduous winter as a momentary shiver and a shaking off of leaves. The king regent, he says pensively, leaning back in his chair. Is he a good ruler? You look around to your companions. You're not quite sure how to answer such a question. From your home in the South, you have so little to do with the capital that you function almost as your own independent kingdom. You know the half-elves are headed to the king's festival to have audience and seek sole sovereignty for their people and Marana hails from a region plagued by famine and failing crop. From such testimony, one could assume that the regent is an ineffective ruler. But what makes a good king, you wonder? What made the old king, who is remembered fondly by most throughout the kingdom, good, if anything? Do you merely see him as much of the past through rose-tinted spectacles? As none of your party is eager to answer Lear's question, he continues to speak as if in response to himself. There was once a great leader in this country, he says, so long ago, it seems, I cannot recall his name. Only that he never called himself king, for it was before such rigid things as kingdoms and cities. He was a mighty warrior. I may not look it, but I too was strong and energetic once, and I fought loyally at his side but he was also wise and truly kind. His people loved him, and even those who rose once against his rule were welcomed in defeat to join his brotherhood. Dwarves, elves, and men all united under his banner, 
and hearkened to the call of his hunting horn. As Lear describes the legendary warrior, your eyes drift lazily to the flickering fire in the hearth. In the smoke and flame you can almost see him, the great ruler of ages past, in silhouette charging into battle in one instant and breaking bread in the next. Lear continues, In the time he lived, it seemed peace would forever reign in the land. Sharp edges were softened, swords cast aside. War seemed a thing of the distant past, only a memory, but it was not to be. His army, restless after years of fighting, turned on one another. When evil without was defeated, discontent only festered within. So it was that in a great battle, this hero whose cherished name sits on my tongue that I cannot manage to recover, was slain. With him, many of his loyalist companions perished. I survived and came here to live alone and keep my own country. But this is not, I think, the end of the tale. I converse at times with the trees with the birds and insects and deer of the forest. They carry the songs of men and elves. One which soothes my morning heart is of the great man who once united us all. Now he was carried away after the battle and lain to sleep within a burial mound with his closest companions. And how... Surrounded by flowers and healing herbs, they slumber to this day, awaiting the hour of the realm's greatest need, when they might yet be awakened. Something stirs in you, the sleeping creature who lifted its head within the magic shop, perhaps, You think about the hypnotic purple flowers and Marana's sleeping draft. You think of the solemn sleepers only awoken at the sound of a bronze bell. And there's something else. What was it the bone caster cried after you as you fled the occult shop? Beneath it all, you can hear the echoes of the legend, permutations and variations on it. A slumbering hero waiting to be called to service again. A king under the mountain. An army ready to awaken. Do you know the location of the burial mound? You ask. You're not sure why, but you feel that some answers must lie there. You feel there must be a higher force at work that's brought you and your company together and to the door of the ancient elf. Perhaps you think, though the life you've lived till now has been entirely ordinary, You are to play a greater part in the story than you'd come to expect. I've not been there myself, Lear says with a sigh. My heart is too heavy at the loss of my captain. I fear that if I came to the foot of his grave and found I could not wake him, that the sorrow would be too much to bear. But I think one who is swift of foot and keen of sight could follow the song of the King Wren 
and find the place of which I speak. You mull this riddling advice as you finish your mug of tea, rich with the herbs and florals of the elf's garden. Even now, the perfume of his many flowers mingle on a breeze that sweeps in through an open window. You feel very much at peace and also bright with curiosity about Lear's legendary warrior. Your host graciously offers you warm beds and blankets for the night if you wish to stay. You gladly accept the offer. In time, he bids you all good night and turns in before retiring to the quarters at the end of the hall, you and your companions converse for a while by the warm fire. How much has changed since first you met only yesterday evening, and yet how much is the same. Still you gather in the presence of keen hospitality before the flickering flames of a hearth fire sharing stories of the old myth and magic of the realm. You are the first to suggest that tomorrow morning, rather than turning back toward the road, you make for the burial mound of Lear's legend to investigate. There are a few days yet till the festival commences, and such an unusual sight deserves a look. Besides, there's something inside you that won't let go of the story, that feels drawn to the old hero's resting place. You can't quite explain it. Morana is hesitant. She's had enough of wandering off into strange forests, and who knows what dangers you might encounter on the way with only the whimsical guidance to follow the King Wren, there's every possibility that you'll become lost in the wood. Bright buckle, whistle, and thorn seem torn on the issue, intrigued by everything that comes from the mouth of a true elf, but equally worried about traveling too far off course. All four, and you, agree to sleep on the issue and make a plan in the morning. You extinguish the fire. Outside the cottage, you can hear crickets chirping in a lulling rhythm. You and your companions retire to comfortable beds in the house of Lear. Your dreams are full of music, the low, sonorous bursts of a distant horn, a playful trill that dances through your head. You can still hear the trill when your mind wakes. With your eyes still closed, you roll over, hoping to bury your face in the pillow and sneak in a few more minutes of the cozy sleep you've enjoyed. But soon the trilling sound is joined by the plink of water and rustle of leaves, a whole symphony of forest noises waking with the sun. The sound is so present, so immediate, that you wonder if the outdoors has migrated inside the small cottage you begin to lose hope of slipping back into a dream state. Your stiff muscles call for stretching, and the bed seems suddenly less comfortable than you remember. Finally, with a yawn, you blink open your eyes. You find yourself at once locked in gaze with a tiny, inquisitive bird 
now you realize with his call that this little creature is the source of the trill that cascaded through your dreams. He perches on a gnarled root beside you, bobbing his tail up and down. A root. It's only at this moment that you perceive how your surroundings have transformed. You don't lie in a bed at all, but on the mossy forest floor, dappled with sunlight. You blink in the brightness and look around to see your companions, each also stirring and waking now to find their beds and chambers vanish. Your bags and bows and possessions are nearby, untouched. But there is no sign that you can see of the charming cottage or of the ancient elf's garden. Have you all happened to rise in the night and wander out into the woods together? Or is something more mysterious afoot? You sit up and massage the small of your back, which must have been crunched against a knotted root or some other hard protrusion of the forest floor. But as you look to inspect what's caused the discomfort, you find a curious, man-made object in the spot where you slumbered. You pick it up gingerly, and turn it over in your hands. It's made of iron or bronze and has a significant weight in your hands. It's smooth and curved, adorned with spirals, with a narrow end and a mouth that opens like the tubular flowers that make the sleeping draft. It's a horn a hunting horn. Your friends, bleary-eyed and dizzy with confusion, gather round to get a closer look at the artifact. The little bird chatters on a nearby bush. The feathers on his head are golden yellow, contrasting with the muddy brown of his back and belly making it look like he's wearing a crown. The King Wren. Within a short time, you and your party are off in pursuit of the little bird. He's easy to follow, however, and seems in tune with your quest. Hesitations cast off, you move through the forest swiftly, and every league or so, the wren stops to perch on a branch and wait for you to catch up. The horn is tied at your waist and feels quite natural there. Each of you is now convinced that your encounter with Lear was of a magical nature that he appeared on the path to send you on a vital adventure, one that binds your shared destiny. How tight the bonds of fellowship have been bound between you all in such a short time, or you thought you'd find only travel companions, a troop with which to weather the perils of the road. Now, you feel part of a whole, no matter your differences. Part of something bigger than yourself. It's not quite midday when the wren slows his going. You've no doubt that you move further from the king's road with every pace. But you are confident that this is the path you're meant to tread. And soon you come to a shining heath, fragrant with yellow wildflowers. Tall grass sparkles in the high sun, 
and waves in the perfumed wind, rising like a breath or like the rolling waves of open ocean. In the center of the heath is a tall, sloping barrow. The grass grows coarse upon it, speckled with violet flowers. So rustic and untouched is this place that you wonder how long it's been hidden. Have others followed the King Wren? Or has this burial mound been waiting for you? Even in its abandoned state, You have no doubt that the place is sacred. The blanket of wildflowers seems a gift of nature to adorn the resting halls of the slumbering hero. The wind rises with a swell of birdsong. It's strange, says the Lady Marana. But once more, I feel I know this place. So do I, says Brightbuckle. Whistle and Thorn agree. And I, you echo. Somehow it feels like this is where my journey has always been leading. The question is, what will you do now? Will he wake the sleeping hero and his companions? Is this the time set forth, the hour of the realm's greatest need? You can feel the bronze hunting horn at your hip, heavy and familiar, like a missing piece. Just as the wise woman's bell can wake the drinkers of the sleeping potion, you know this horn is how you wake the heroes of ages past. You lift it to your lips, feeling the irresistible urge to sound the horn to the hollow hills. But first you look to your friends, to thorn and Whistle, and Bright Buckle, and Marana. Each has a look in their eye like fire ablaze. Curiosity, courage, and commitment in one expression. You draw in a deep and rapturous breath. Hold the horn to your lips and blow. The sound of the horn is like the groaning of an ancient tree, the rushing of water through a river, and a long trapped sigh. It travels on a spiral of wind and wakes the leaves of the trees to shiver. You can feel it in your chest, and in the hairs that rise on the back of your neck. The birds and woodland creatures hush their sounds, and all stand still, turning its attention to the heath and the barrow. In the brief but unending moment between the blast of the bugle and what comes next, you think it must not have worked that you've been on a fool's quest, straying so far from the king's road into the echoes of forgotten mysteries. But then it comes, like a tremor in the ground, like a chorus of light and shadow. You feel it in the soles of your feet, where they meet the grass and earth, a feeling of connection with the land, of safety and nourishment, a sensation of warmth and light 
begins to travel up through your body as if you were a vessel, a chalice into which a tingling energy is being poured. You feel the warmth and light in your ankles, in your lower legs, your knees, which soften and relax into the sensation, your upper legs, warm, white light traveling smoothly to relax your hips and pelvis, filling up the belly, softening the lower back, The sensation of warmth and light moves into your waist, your chest, and upper back. Softens your shoulders, your upper arms, elbows, forearms, and wrists, the palms of your hands, the backs of your hands. You feel the light and warmth trickle into your fingers and shine through your fingertips. The sensation travels up into your neck and the base of your head, into the jaw, relaxing the muscles of the face, Warmth and light filling you up to the crown of your head, tingling in your scalp, till you feel entirely soft and light, like your whole body is made of light. Still, you feel connected to the solid ground, tethered to and cherished by the material world. You breathe deeply into this sensation, feeling the light of your body glow brighter with each inhale and dim subtly with each exhale. For a few breaths, all you can see is this brightening and dimming of your own light. You feel very much at rest, at ease, and tranquil. But you also feel more aware, awakened to something like the creature within who slumbered so peacefully for so long, has at last come into full and acute awareness. Somewhere you can still hear the echo of the hunting horn, but it feels less like an isolated blast and more like a small part of the fabric of the universe the ringing harmony of stars and suns very, very far away. In time, your eyes see past the curtain of light, or perhaps the light of your body diminishes, softening back into the scene. The grassy heath and sloping barrow come once more into focus, with slow, soft gesture, you turn to behold your companions. They're still here, still beside you, and yet they look changed. Are they taller, wiser, older? You cannot say. 
but there is no doubt that they are different, as are you. No one else stands in the meadow. No shades rise from the burial mound. No army visibly awakens to the call of the hunting horn. But the king wren calls to break the ineffable silence. And with his song comes the flood of a thousand memories. Tales of a time forgotten. Of heroes and sorcerers and dragons and war. In your heart swells the strength and courage of a warrior, the pride and passion of a leader, and the quiet kindness of a friend. A hero, long asleep, awaiting the hour of greatest need, awakens within you. His whole history rises to meet and entangle with yours, and you welcome the newfound wisdom and experience of the ages. Around you, your companions are also awakening to new strength and new memories. Between you, the bonds of friendship are cast in bronze, stronger than before, emboldened by fireside tales and centuries of shared anticipation. Your eyes meet, and in them are the tears of reunion across untold lengths of time. You are you, still with all the heart and talents of the merchant from the south. But in you also dwells the soul of the hunting horn's master, uniter of peoples, friend to all. You breathe deep, inhaling the scent of summer on the heath, as if for the first time, the purple trumpet flowers on the vine, the verdant grass, the soil. It's rich and welcoming. You lift your gaze to the skies, half expecting to see dragons on wing. You breathe out rolling your shoulders and releasing your mind and body from many hundreds of years of sleep. A soft knock at the door stirs you gently from dreams. You don't open your eyes just yet, clinging for a few moments more to the fantastical images that have danced through your mind in this last hour of sleep. In the dream, you think, you were moving through a forest, thick with mist, in a country that seemed to be bathed in midnight sun. All around in the mist of the dream, you saw shadows move and change their shape until at last the crystals of fog became a million tiny mirrors. You peered into each of them, meeting your reflection in every droplet with curiosity and calm. Never mind. The dream whispered to you that the face in each reflection was not your own, but the face of another. They looked just enough like you to sneak through the passageways 
of a surreal dream understanding. Now you shut your eyes tightly, wishing the knocking sound would cease and allow you to drift back into this strange midnight forest. You hold on to the images, the thousand tiny reflections, for as long as you can, trying to make sense of them. But swiftly, the pictures fade into swirls of texture and color, losing their shape and specificity. Another knock follows, this one only slightly more urgent. You call back for the knocker to enter at will, sleep still fogging your voice. You roll over in bed to see the young woman enter with a tray of breakfast. She lowers her eyes and curtsies on entry, then carries the tray over to the table by the window. You slept in later than you should have. The sun streams in, falling in curtains across the wardrobe, where hangs the fine garment you are expected to wear today. You thank the young woman warmly. Your grace, she says quietly. Your father requests your presence as soon as you're ready in the throne room. You can tell him I'll be by soon, you respond. The woman curtsies again and exits the room quickly. You stretch, roll your shoulders and your neck, and pull on a silk robe that hangs on the edge of the bed. The breakfast platter smells very tempting. You sit down to eat, still grasping at the memory of the decadent dreams through which you so recently swam. But they won't come back to you in any coherent way. Your mind turns to the day ahead. For weeks now, the energy of the court has been elevated, anticipatory. Today is the first of a multi-day festival thrown by your father, and preparations have long been underway. Subjects are traveling from all over the kingdom, even from the remote forests and distant southern regions places you've only dreamt of visiting. The excitement is palpable and contagious, with every day strengthening your desire to venture beyond the castle walls you so rarely leave behind. After eating your fill of breakfast, you dress yourself in the gold and crimson threads hanging in the wardrobe, Certainly, you think, addressing yourself in the mirror. You look the part of the heir apparent, the one who will succeed their father's throne. But the collar itches, and the exquisite details in the brocade, while undoubtedly made by someone with great skill, are so rigid and formal they seem to belong to someone else. You never feel quite like yourself when done up in the fashions of the nobility. It's more like a mask. This is a charmed life, of course, but a lonely one. Most days are filled with lessons in the art of courtly behavior, in swordcraft, and in reading and studying languages. You have no siblings, and there's never anyone your own age about the castle, so your most meaningful relationships are with your tutors. 
There are days in which you long for mischief and adventure, for breaking free of the restrictive lifestyle of court to wander the capital city and beyond, for a formative experience of any kind for the matter. The sound of voices rising from the courtyard below your window causes your attention to drift. You wander to the window and gaze down to observe the source. Far below, dabbled through the shade trees, you can see a small group dressing the fountain with bunting and draping flags across the courtyard. It seems the castle gates themselves will open, you realize, at some point during the festival, allowing non-courtiers within for the first time you can remember. The bells sound from the chapel, intoning the hour. They clamor brightly across the morning air and remind you of your purpose. Your father won't wish to be kept waiting. You leave the chamber, leaping lightly down the stone steps and down long corridors draped with tapestries and hung with armory. When you reach the throne room, you find your father standing before the elevated throne, his back to you. He's alone, with no attendance. He hears your footsteps and turns his head so that his profile is gilded with sunlight from the rose window above the throne. There you are, he says. His voice is gentle, which brings you some ease. I wanted to see you before all the excitement begins. Now he turns to you and places a hand on your shoulder. How are you feeling about this evening? You're not quite sure how to answer. It's a curious mix of emotions that have run through you these many weeks. On your last birthday, when you officially came of age, your father the king regent, shared with you his plans to surrender the throne and announce your imminent succession. It wasn't something you were prepared for. Always you'd known you would one day take over his seat, but this was a distant and vague proposition. You never thought it might come so soon and at a time when you are still changing so much, still discovering who you are. Still, your father insisted that this kingdom, so long ruled under a single dynasty before he came to power, would never be satisfied under the reign of a regent, a temporary figurehead. They need a true leader, a monarch to see them through times of peace and of turmoil, someone they can trust. This you could understand, but are you that person, you who have experienced so little of the world? You've had some time to process the impending announcement, but all these complex feelings stir once more in you at your father's question. You deliver, however, a practiced response. I hope to serve our kingdom as nobly as you have, your grace. He smiles warmly, and gives your shoulder a squeeze. 
He reminds you of the hour at which you'll be expected, but urges you to remain in the castle, preferably in your chamber, till his steward comes to fetch you. Surely you have reading to do for your lessons. Though your heart yearns to leave these walls and get out into the thick of the festival, you do not protest. You know better. Once you're dismissed, you leave the throne room behind, contemplating means by which you might sneak out into the crowds unnoticed. You take the long way back to your chamber, passing through the quiet, elegant corridors of the castle. Your family's banners have been freshly hung throughout the halls, depicting the heraldic symbol of your clan, the two-tailed lion set in black on gold thread. You pull your shoulders back and try to think of yourself as the embodiment of a lion, strong, self-assured, committed. Still, it feels like a guise, like something there to mask the real you. And how, you wonder, are you ever to truly know who you are if you're stuck within these walls? You'd been so looking forward to stepping out into the streets for the festival, but your father's instruction echoes in your ears. There must be a way, you think. It's at this very moment that the young woman who brought breakfast to your chamber this morning enters the corridor. She's carrying bundles of cloth piled so high in her arms that they nearly obscure her face. But you recognize the eyes peeking over the bundle. At the sight of you, she stops, drops to a deferential curtsy, and resumes her pace. Wait, you call after her as she breezes past you. She spins around, appearing startled. Your grace, she says. How may I help? I'm terribly sorry, you say. But I don't know your name. Lunette, she responds, a hint of inquisition behind her voice, as if she's surprised to hear someone of your rank take any interest in her. Lunette, you say, I'm sure you've many things to do, but I hope you'll pardon the delay on my behalf. Of course, your grace, she says. You don't have to call me that all the time, you say with a small laugh and you ask her to simply use your name. Behind the bundle of clothes, you catch her blushing. You've just had an idea, a wonderful idea. I wonder, you say cautiously, if you might be willing to help me. When, shortly thereafter, You are dressed in unassuming linens from the scullery and you're moving through the passageways in the castle walls you never knew were there, the ones used by staff and attendants when they must move about unseen. You think you must find a way to repay Lunette for her kindness and willingness to abet your escape from tight quarters on this most exciting day. You follow her directions to the letter. Two lefts, 
aright and take the steps down until you meet the water. There is a concealed dock there for small shipments and undercover passage. A humble little boat bobs in the water just at the bottom of the steps. You emerge into dazzling sunlight after the stretch of darkness. The light shimmers off the surface of the river and a cool breeze fills your lungs with fresh, bright air. Just as Lunette said, there is a narrow towpath along the river leading away from the castle. Holding a hand across your brow to shield your eyes from the late morning sun, you set down it toward the heart of the city. It's a peculiar view you have of the castle in which you've spent your life. You've never seen it from this angle. Looking up at the walls and ramparts, it seems imposing, impenetrable. You wonder how it must appear to those who've never seen what lies within. But then, to gaze across the river and toward its vanishing point yonder, how much more fully you can breathe in this moment. As you come round the perimeter, the towpath rises and turns slightly, fading into the cobbled paths and passages that lead into the city beneath the castle. Faintly, you can hear the strains of music rising over the rooftops. So, you think, the celebration has begun. You follow the music through the labyrinthine streets, past inns and courtyards. The streets soon open onto a spacious square filled with people and lined with market stalls. A great column marks the center, adorned with stone lions round its base. A band of musicians play an uplifting tune on the lute and pipe. From the column to the buildings on all sides, your family's banners are strung, flitting golden in the breeze. Colonnades and impressive half-timbered facades make up the perimeter of the square and an exquisite clock tower overhangs the scene, its spire piercing the drifting clouds. The bustle of the crowd lifts the energy of the place, and the sense of palpable excitement gives you goosebumps. You can't remember the last time you saw so many people in one place. And all are abuzz, it seems, with anticipation as they consort, barter, and sell their wares. Oh, the crisp air is filled with the sizzling scent of the most sumptuous spices from the food stalls. The music is playful and cheery. Your approach in all the hubbub, has gone unnoticed by the crowds, so consumed in their activities. The borrowed linens hang loosely on your frame, much more comfortably so than the royal costume that waits back at the castle. You feel a great sense of liberation, like you can move unhindered, unobserved, for the first time. No one here knows your name, 
your rank, or the seat to which you will so soon ascend. And with that uncanny anonymity comes great freedom. You go forward with a lightness in your step you've never had before, a bounce and a brightness to experience life outside the walls and the expectations. You're moved by the faces you find in the crowds, the young and the old, their eyes. Each person here you think has a story, most of which you may never know. What are their lives like, you wonder? Where do they come from? How big are their families? It isn't long before you encounter folks who look vastly different from you, or indeed anyone you've ever met. People with pointed ears and distinct, elongated features. You've always known that the kingdom, reaching as far and wide as it does, is home to many races, including half-elves, but you've never seen one. The increasing multitude and splendid diversity of the square spurs you to greater and greater curiosity. It's like you've spent your whole life reading only one story, only to learn that that story is but a chapter of a vast and expansive volume. If only you can bring yourself to turn a new page. You perambulate the square, visiting many of the market stalls to examine the items for sale. A merchant from the east displays herbs and spices in decorative glass bottles. These exude the most extraordinary aromas. Some are earthy and savory, others uplifting and vivid. Another trader sells hand-carved trinkets and statuary, including miniature wood carvings of your father and the two-tailed lion symbol of your house. It's funny to hold such a powerful symbol in the palm of your hand and to look down upon your own regal father. It's a good likeness, I think you'll find, says the carver, an elderly man with kind, dark eyes who seems effusively proud of his work and eager to please. He speaks with excitement and hope about the expected opening of the castle gates and how wondrous it might be to catch a glimpse of the king's heir. You feel the color rising in your cheeks and have to remind yourself that in this guise, no one knows your true identity. The man's earnestness moves your heart, and you buy one of his lion figurines with a few coins you've smuggled out in your pockets. It really is a lovely piece, you think. Perhaps it will make a welcome thank you gift. For Lunette. As you continue your stroll through the market stalls, you turn the hand carved lion over absent mindedly in your hands. You feel a rising tenderness toward these people from all walks of life, and your spirits are lifted by the encounter with the old carver.
who holds your father and your house in such high regard. These people will soon look to you for leadership, and you need only follow in the footsteps of your father, it seems, to earn their trust. But this sensation you have, almost of walking on air, reveals itself quickly to be an illusion. It's not long before you overhear a group of peasants decrying the extravagance of the king regent in throwing this festival when so many of his subjects are living in mean conditions. Elsewhere, you hear lamentations for the old king whom your father replaced in a great coup before you were born. Now there was a true leader, a woman says, a dragon at heart. Even as she says this, you stumble on the cobblestones, recovering and ensuring that no one's noticed your clumsiness. You look down at the uneven ground. Indeed, it's not on mere cobbles that you've tripped, but over a bronze inlay in the stones. Embossed in the metal is the burnished symbol of the royal house that held the keys to the castle before yours did. The dragon. Such symbols are not hard to find in forgotten places, even within the castle. For all your father's efforts, history and memory are not so easily erased, and many are alive still who remember the old king and the dynasty that came before. There are dragons carved in relief on the castle's very gate and in abstract form on the royal chapel's tracery. It's natural that you might find traces of this recent history laid in the groundwork of the capital city the dragons built and still aflame in the hearts of disenfranchised commoners. But there's something about the appearance of this symbol in this moment that rattles you, as if stirring up unconscious feelings or half-forgotten dreams. It's something like deja vu, you suppose. You're roused from deep thought by the tender sensation of a hand upon your shoulder. At first, you imagine it to be your father having discovered your little gambit. But this hand is softer, lighter than the stern hand of the king regent. It's a woman's hand you realize, as you look up into the face of the stranger. Are you all right? She asks, her voice smooth and low. We saw you take a tumble there. The lady is richly robed, clearly higher born than many of the people in the square. Around her neck, hangs a glittering amulet. Raven dark curls frame her face. Yes, I'm fine, you insist, though your voice trembles, more from the recognition of this symbol beneath your feet than from the fall. A motley crew of others have gathered, another human and three half-elves evidently of varying station. 
You fear you may have attracted more attention than you can afford. But it becomes clear that the group, however unalike, know each other, and no one else seems moved by the minor commotion. Oh dear, you are quite shaken, the lady says. Come now, why don't we get you somewhere you can sit down? Yes, chimes in one of the half-elves. Won't you come have a drink? And he inclines his head toward a nearby alehouse. Your first instinct is to refuse. But on second thought, you do crave retreat from the eyes of so many onlookers. You agree to let the party take you somewhere quiet where you can regain your composure. The alehouse may not be entirely quiet, but the hum of a dozen overlapping conversations is comforting in its own way. You slide into benches near an open window where the breeze is cool on your face. The unusual crew of humans and half-elves bring mugs of ale and mead to the table. Their rapport with each other is strong, and while you speak little at first, you learn much about them and the way they relate to each other. They've traveled together for many days, it seems and had only just reached the capital when they came across you. We haven't even got a place to stay yet, says the merchant from the south, but we've always been able to find hospitality, haven't we? For better or worse, he laughs. You ease into their company, shaking off the reverie and concern and you begin to take interest in their stories. They come from all corners of the kingdom, from the far-flung forests of the northern country, from the southern seaport, and from villages so small you've never seen them rendered on a map. Their lives sound vastly different from your own, or indeed from anyone you can imagine living in the capital. They seem to have stepped into your life from the pages of legend, rather than from the king's road. You learn of their intentions for traveling hither, over long distances, and through many adventures and perils. The half-elves, who hail from the green forest, long for sovereignty in their own lands, after a tacit agreement with the old king, crumbled in the hands of your father, who has levied large taxes against them. They hope to petition the regent for a new treaty. The lady, a wise woman and herbal healer, seeks aid for her village after blighted harvests. The merchant, meanwhile, who set out only to sell his exotic dyes and silks to the affluent people of the capital, has been troubled to learn of the poor living conditions many face and fears his region will suffer next. You listen intently soaking in their stories, the authenticity of their desires, and the ache in their hearts. Only those with deep conviction could have traveled so far, overcoming such obstacles in pursuit of a better life for their people. And you feel deep sorrow for their plight, and for your family's role 
in the unseen troubles of a nation. They too are the people you intend to serve, though they may hail from far away, holding your house accountable for their hardship. They will be your responsibility as much as the admiring carver or the denizens of the capital. This is the first time you've contemplated the true scope of your destiny and the far-reaching consequences of your actions. You wonder if you have the wisdom and the strength to meet such multitudes. But then, you suppose, opening your eyes to the reality of life in the kingdom is the first step to righting wrongs and repairing trust. It's the first step to good leadership, in your estimation at least. And if you are indeed to take the throne, you would endeavor to be good, to be loved by your people. When the companions seek to know your story, you aren't sure what to say, so you don't say much, only that you've resided here in the capital all your life, seeing little of the world beyond that all you hope for is peace in the realm. The half-elves share a sidelong glance and a chuckle. What is it, you ask? What's funny? Don't pay them any mind, says the merchant. They shouldn't laugh at such a thing, with all the whispers about these days. What whispers? You press on. The party huddles closer and their voices lower. You mean the rumors haven't reached the capital yet, says the half-elf called Brightbuckle. You know what happened to the old king, don't you? Of course, you say. Everyone does. But even as the words escape your lips, you question whether they're true. After what you've heard today, is it even possible that in your sheltered existence, you've heard an unbiased account of the old kings being put down by your father's guard? Well, Brightbuckle continues, the thing is, the old king had a child, one who everyone thought was long gone. Only if you believe the whispers, they're not so gone after all. You mean, you say, wheels turning in your mind, the lady who's called Morana picks up the sentence where you left off, there's someone out there with a claim to the throne who might be gathering support at this very moment, which might put a damper on your dream of peace. Something awakens in your mind. Again, you seem to feel the sense of deja vu brought on by the dragon icon in the cobblestones. You seem to see, swimming to the surface of your mind, the face that arose to meet your reflection in last night's mysterious dream. A face so like your own, you took it as such in the dream world. Was this, then, the face of your unknown rival for the throne? the child of the old king, whose life yours might have been had things been different. 
the bearer of the dragon symbol all these years in hiding, and yet free of the confines of court. You can't explain it, but tears spring to your eyes and your chest swells as if your heart has somehow become more capacious. For so long, you felt unsure about your succession to the throne. Was it because, deep down, you somehow knew this fate was meant for someone else? Are you all right? Morana's voice cuts clearly through the fog of your thoughts. You lift your gaze to meet hers. These whispers, you say, brushing past her concern. Do they speculate as to the whereabouts of the old king's heir? Nothing concrete, says the merchant. But the same rumors claim that dragons are flying again over the western mountains. Really, you say, your eyes wide. But dragons haven't been seen since, well, since before I was born. I thought they were extinct. They are, says Brightbuckle. But I dare say we've seen our share of impossible things on the road. The companions share knowing glances. Somehow, though they don't say another word about it, you sense that they've been brought closer together by these impossible encounters. They've had some great adventure together the kind you've always longed for. The conversation turns, then, to lighter topics, and the half-elves arrange for plates of food to be brought to the table. The merchant barters with the landlady of the alehouse for the last of the available rooms upstairs, and you slide into a sense of comfort with your new friends. Music travels from the square as the festivities get underway in earnest without. After a meal, you follow the merry company out onto the square where the afternoon sun casts long shadows from the clock tower over the crowds A troupe of actors are performing on a platform stage beneath the central column. They are presenting, it seems, a dramatization of the great deeds of your father's reign. You're surprised, though perhaps you shouldn't be, to find that you are also a character in the play the valiant heir, a chip off the old block who's destined to do great things for the realm. The actor playing you bears a muslin tunic with a golden lion emblazoned across the chest and holds aloft a wooden sword. Despite the flowery language, and bombastic performances. The action falls flat for you now that you've spent some time among the kingdom's common folk and learned of their everyday struggles. You wonder how much of your own story you've built upon a fantasy. The face of your mysterious rival swims to the forefront of your mind again. It's funny, you think, how that face is so much more recognizable to you 
than the face of the actor on the stage who enacts your destiny. All of this, you deduce, is in the service of preparing the festival goers for this evening. They'll get to know you in this shining, gallant form on the stage. And then they'll cheer for the announcement of your succession. The announcement. You turn to the clock tower and wince when you see the time. You must have gotten carried away in your cavorting with the jolly companions. Now you've got to get back to the castle right away, lest your little escapade be discovered, if indeed you haven't been found out already. Whispering a hurried farewell to the lady, the merchant, and the half-elves, who regard you with bemused expression, you slip away through the crowds of onlookers. Careful to watch your step on the cobblestones, you find a small alleyway that diverts from the square. This you follow to the towpath along the walls of the castle. You go over Lunette's instructions for the castle's secret passageways in your head, this time in reverse, up the steps from the dock, then left. The river waters lap at the rocks below, catching the waning light of the afternoon. Your breathing steadies, As you approach the entrance to the hidden dock, you'll make it in time. But as you begin to climb the steps, ascending from the dock, something tugs at you. Some part of you resists going back inside the castle that has so long held you at a distance from the world from the strange and wonderful people in it, from the truth. You take a deep breath and turn on the spot. There, tied up and floating on the surface of the water, just as before, is the tiny boat. You just need a moment to think. You close your eyes and try to conjure an image of the near future. An image of yourself, proud and confident, with the strength and loyalty of the lion. Wearing the crown your father placed on your head sitting on a throne above hopeful petitioners. You try to see yourself as a great ruler, beloved by all from the capital city to the southernmost tip of the kingdom, from the green forests to the forgotten villages. But try as you might, The image just won't form in your mind. Instead, you see the face from your dreams. The face of someone you refuse to believe is your enemy. For the very thought of this person gives you immeasurable comfort and hope. As if they are calling out to you across the river and the mountains, across time, across the alternate lives you might have lived. By the time you open your eyes, you know that you cannot go back within the walls of the castle. Not today. 
You reach into the pocket of your borrowed clothes and close your hand around the wood-carved lion figurine. You run a hand across the natural grooves in its mane and the cleft in its tail. Then, placing it gently on the top stair, you hope it will find its way into Lunette's hands. Quietly, you whisper your thanks to her. She's done more today than facilitate a whimsical adventure. She has set something in motion beyond imagining. And with a full heart and a clear mind, you step into the little boat and untie it from the dock. You've never sailed before, but the river flows west toward the setting sun and the mountains. With luck, it may bring you to the feet of this forgotten heir, the last of the dragons. You wonder if it was a boat like this from the same dock which carried the old king's child to safety so many years ago. How strangely history harmonizes with itself. Somehow, you know you will find them, as if there is an invisible thread that weaves your fates together in a vast tapestry. It's impossible to see the whole picture now, only the smallest of stitches, only this choice and the next. You spare a long gaze back at the castle, curled atop the city's great hill, its walls high and impenetrable. You breathe in the fresh air, the wind from the water whipping through your hair. You taste freedom and unlimited possibility but also deep responsibility. Whatever the future holds, you owe much to the kind company who sat with you today, to the people of the capital, to the forgotten folk beyond the city. Silently, you make a vow to remember them to fight for them, whether you wear the crown or not. The river stretches on before you, glistening under the setting sun. The whole world sparkles, impossibly alive with hope and potential. And so, On you go, to meet your fate, to find a friend.